Thanks for joining us for this spooky Halloween episode 282 of the Clive Barker podcast. In, th in this episode, uh, Jose and Ryan are joined by Ed Martinez and Nina Arlene with special returning guest Peter Atkins. We come back to his life in Liverpool, growing up with Clive Barker, uh, his amazing fiction, and of course, Hellraiser. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination Shop is dedicated to the Arts and Medicine Program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center, and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. Uh, there's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the videos and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Check out his artwork and find out what inspired me to buy the Sentinel. Ah, I've got this upside down. Okay, the Sentinel. Uh, in episode 257, Art and Inspiration with Don Bertram. All right, well, welcome. This is episode number... Oh, my gosh, I just covered up the thing. I'm going to start that again. <laughs> okay. I... Welcome. This is episode 282 of the Clyde Barker Podcast. Uh, Halloween. It's our Halloween episode with the return of Pe Peter Atkins. Yeah. Hey. And and uh, hi guys. Hi. Good morning. And and I'm Ryan. And we've got uh, just and I'm Joe. Joe. And uh, Ed, Ed and Nina are the spooky voices there. <laughs> Very spooky. Yeah, yeah. Haunted podcast. Yeah. So uh, Lean hard people. Yeah. <laughs> So today we're the Atkins cast, the Peter Atkins podcast. Yeah. Well, let's not go too far. <laughs> uh, we don't want to make him jealous. Yeah. <laughs> the Liverpudlian mafia. Yeah. The, right. There you go. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So it's great having you again, Pete. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for asking me back. This is great. Yeah. Now you've been doing YouTube. You have the Rolling Darkness Review YouTube channel. Um, with Glenn Hirschberg, of course, you're, yeah. he's, uh, algae, algae to your art. I, I, <laughs> you are algae. I am algae. He is arty. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, they're, they're just, the very, no intention of being disrespectful. Um, but there's sort of irreverent riffs on Algernon Blackwood and Arthur Mackin, who are two of our favorite classic horror and ghost story writers. And um, spooky, and, yeah, they are spooky. And um, <laughs> and I had to be algae. I, I'm I revere both of them. Mackin is a particular favorite of mine. Um, but <laughs> but Glenn insisted that he got to be. I came up with the names, <laughs> and then Glenn said, I'm Artie, and yes. I said, No, I'm Artie, <laughs> and he said, I don't want to be algae. So, you know, uh, anything for it's quiet green life, and but, slimy. So. <laughs> yeah. You you guys have been doing the um, the Rolling Darkness review since 2004, right? Yes, the live show started in 2004. The, the channel just went up a few months ago, as you know. But, right. um, yeah, it started – the first live performance was 2004. I don't know how much boring prehistory you want me to go into – Sure. I'll make it I'm, fast. Yeah. I mean. um, the uh, the late great and my close friend Dennis Etchison, who sadly we lost last year, yeah. he had been talking for a few years about the desire to do some kind of collective reading live performance thing. Um, I think possibly, in fact, he'd first have talked about it with his older friend, also a friend of mine, the great George Clayton Johnson, who is a Twilight Zone writer. That's probably what he's most well known for. Though he also created Ocean's Eleven. He was he was the oh, original wow. writer of Ocean's Eleven. And he wrote some classic Twilight Zone episodes. And he was still knocking around L.A. for the first 20 years I lived here and was a great guy. With the big beard and the yes, white exactly. brim hat. The, the, yeah. the world's oldest hippie because George was 
technically, really, he should have been a beatnik. He was beatnik generation. He was born in the late 20s, I think, born 1929. Um, but and, and you see pictures of him, by the way, hanging out in the Twilight Zone set with Robert Redford, who was yeah. in one of his more famous episodes, Nothing in the Dark. And um, and George looks like a beat poet. He's got, like, the big brill-creamed quiff hair, the horn rim <laughs> glasses, and looks very cool. But... At the age of 35, way too old to be a hippie, George became a hippie and smoked more marijuana than anybody I've ever known in my life. Yeah, baby. Never, <laughs> never without his little pipe. And the silver hair grew long and the beard grew long. And he had a succession of hippie hats. He was a great guy. Anyway. That's um, he and Dennis had talked... I believe a little about that sort of idea, but they haven't done anything. And then Dennis would sort of prompt me, hey, you know, we should do something, blah, 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 this sort of idea. Um, I, I love Dennis. I, I still use the present tense, but I also knew him very well. So I knew that what that meant was, hey, Pete, make this happen. <laughs> and I'll sit back and show up when it's ready. Mm, so yeah. I never really, I never really bit. And then in 2004, I got a phone call from Glenn, who I'd met briefly once, I think, before that. But he'd done a signing with Dennis, and um, not knowing Dennis quite as well as I did, he'd been suckered in, and said. Uh, oh, Dennis said I should call you. We'll uh, we're going to do this show and blah blah blah. <laughs> so and I thought, ah, oh, fate, fate has matchmaking. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so Glenn and I did all the work, and Dennis just showed up and read because <laughs> that's what he wanted, and uh, we were fine with it. And in fact, Dennis was only with us for a couple of years. The, the first two shows we did, um, and then he <laughs> and then he decided even showing up was oh. too much. So actually what happened was the first year we just read extracts from existing work uh, because we were still like working out what the show was. And then from the second year on, Glenn and I said, we're going to do a chapbook of original stories every year. So we've all got to write a story for the show, at which point Dennis said, fuck you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not That's too much work. I'm, Right. I'm not on a deadline for the likes of you. <laughs> um, so, so we stayed very close friends, but he he became a rolling dark emeritus, let's say. <laughs> and so Glenn and I took over the show and we did it, first of all, in bookstores and and weird places like parking lots outside record stores. And then eventually we graduated to small black box theaters. And Pete, what year was that horror convention in San Francisco that you read? In the oh, park? Right, that's right. That was, I'm going to, uh, and Kim was our guest. Kim Newman was guest uh -huh. with us. Yep, yep. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. What year was that? 07? 06? Something uh, like 05? You know, it was I early it was on. Um, it was like the secret horror convention in San Francisco <laughs> that nobody knew about. <laughs> they advertised I can't remember. Little, right? I mean, like what, a secret meeting. <laughs> was it under attended? I remember it being quite a good convention. Oh, Although, it was to be honest, it was fun, but it was, it was all the but, people. And, gee, you know. It was all the exhibitors <laughs> who were having fun. Oh, was that right? Yeah. yeah, you're right, because you I wasn't notice. there for the whole weekend. <laughs> I, yeah, Glenn and I drove up. It was a road trip. We just... We might even have driven fun, up the man. day of yeah, the show wow. and just, mm -hmm. like, did the show, hung out with a few people, said hi to you guys, you know, and um, yeah. I'm sure we stayed overnight. But Oh, yeah, I, you stayed in the hotel, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, that would have been 2006, I think. But, yeah, we'd hardly got it going, really. Um, have any of those fun, Have any of those been uh, recorded on video, any of those live shows? If you talk to Glenn, he will insist – that there is a thing that is very real and it is called the curse of the rolling darkness review because <laughs> every year we thought some videoed recording. the show <laughs> and every year it turned out we didn't something oh, went wrong man. and oh, we man. had like we had <laughs> uh, glenn's been both a high school teacher and a university lecturer and we had like high-tech clever people video professionals 
still failed. Wow. Now, I have, I have an old school video cam from, you know, before none of us needed video cams anymore, um, in a closet, which I believe contains a recording of the 2009 show, but I've never tried to play it because I believe Glenn. And I believe there is a curse. Yeah, there is a curse. <laughs> yeah, and I will not bring that upon my household. Wow. But uh, now but I know I'm why gone, I was having video problems this morning. Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> see, even talking about the rolling dark. <laughs> yeah, spooky. Yeah. You're, now you're making me check my recording. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yes. None of this will work. Poltergeist. <laughs> So if we can put a pin on the Rolling Darkness review, so to speak, uh, metaphorically. Yeah. So growing up in Liverpool, right? So sure. you were you were a child of the '60s, um, living. That's very in, kind of you. I was technically a child of the '50s, but I wasn't really conscious. <laughs> I wasn't conscious till the '60s. Yeah. All right. right. So. Uh, <laughs> right. Ed, yeah. Um, so, what? What what were the formative years like? So what what sort of music were you into? What sort of authors were you reading? That I know probably I would venture people like uh, Rex Stout, probably Poe stuff like that, or that came oh, later, like the the it, detective stuff. No, I, I discovered Rex Stout very late in life. I, I love okay. him, but uh, no, I didn't read him as as a kid or a teenager. Um, I was, I mean. The, <laughs> It's quite a span in the 60s because I was four years old when the 60s began and pushing. No, I guess I'd turned 15 by the time they ended. So yeah. obviously that's very different. So when, when, I, when I was four or five, I was reading Superman and Batman. And, um, and of course, I'm, I'm prime generation for the golden age of, well, not literally the golden age, the great age of Marvel. Lee and Kirby launched... The Fantastic Four and Spider Man right. and the Avengers, yeah. all while I was seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. So, 62, 63, that, that yeah, sort of exactly. Yeah. 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 Like the return um, of Boy Justice. So I was, yeah. uh, there you go. Um, I'm that generation. I was like, yeah. I was the age when the 60s exploded. I mean, I was a little kid. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going yeah. to the cavern to see the Beatles. But um, <laughs> the Beatles happened. The British invasion of American rock and roll happened. Marvel comics exploded. James Bond hit the big screen. You know, it, um, London started swinging. It was it was a very busy yeah decade. baby <laughs> yeah exactly. It was a very busy decade with a lot of great stuff going on. Um, I was a kid, um, right. but towards but I I was a prolific reader and. Um, I hadn't discovered Rex Stiles, but I was certainly reading so-called adult books. Mm -hmm. Not that kind of adult. Um, <laughs> I was reading grown-up books yeah. by, you know, 11, 12. I'm, I'm sure like a lot of you guys, like most yeah. of us. Like, I, I was reading a lot of Sherlock Holmes when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, right, exactly. Studying yeah. Scarlet, The Hound of the Baskervilles. And, uh, right. You know, the the – Poe, the father of the detective story, right? That they they attribute yeah. it to Poe because of uh, murders in the Rue Morgue and uh, yeah. the murder of Mary the Chevalier Roger. Auguste Dupin. Yes, the yes. The genitor of uh, Sherlock Holmes, the predecessor. Yeah. That has that. Johnny Depp in Sleepy Hollow isn't the inventor. <laughs> <laughs> well, the jury's still out there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way. Like one of the first instances of, of metafiction was that Holmes discusses Dupin and Poe's stories of Dupin in the Holmes stories. I can't remember precisely. I mean, there's lots of Sherlockians who will tell you chapter and verse, and mm -hmm. I can't remember. But I, I, I believe on more than one occasion, Holmes says makes a sort of sna vaguely snide remark to Watson. To Watson, I think I remember about, that too. About Poe and uh, Dupin and mm -hmm. how, you know, not quite right. Oh. Yeah. The clear implication being that Poe might have invented the form, but I, Conan Doyle, have perfected it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which he did, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I was reading a lot of that stuff. I was re- reading Jules Verne, which I think a lot of kids re- uh, sure, read when they were growing sure. up. And and Conan Doyle, he had that awesome character, Professor Challenger, sure, which is underrated. Boy. Yeah, there's yeah. this story that's amazing. It's called The Day the Earth Screamed. When oh, they're yeah. ready... They're ready to drill into the crust of the earth and then there's a huge scream and like a spurt of like liquid comes out. It's like like the earth was a living creature. But anyway, right. um, cool. So, yeah, Batman. Batman was yeah. heavy on the detective <laughs> all, stories, all those right? Things. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, Batman in Detective Comics. Uh, I was reading DC and Marvel. I was reading – I certainly read some of the Hound stories. My The two I remember being obsessed with as a kid, though, were um, – uh, Fleming's James Bond books and Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan and Mars books. Sure. They were oh, the things yeah. I read most avidly as a John 10, Carter. 11, 12. What did you say? John Carter. John Carter, yeah. The, mm. the first four Mars novels are terrific, and the first five Tarzan novels are terrific. Um, and the later books aren't bad. You know, Burroughs was a, was a you know master of narrative, even if – as some would say, his style might leave a little to be desired. But those those first four or five books in both those series, very solid, interesting, entertaining, wonderfully imaginative stuff. Um, and then the usual suspects, you know, for for people my age or, or anybody that age, um, P.G. Woodhouse I discovered around 12, 13, Raymond Chandler, a whole yeah, – you name it. I read Bradbury. You know, I, I read yeah. Bradbury when I was 12. The, the uh, perfect age to read him. You know, it's like what, if you read Bradbury at 12, you love him for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, Nina about, and yeah. you and Bradbury were all at the same Forey convention. Well, thank you for the opportunity to name drop, Ed. Yeah, <laughs> because much, I'm sure, to the utter astonishment of 12-year-old me, yeah, I actually became friends with Ray for for the last ten years of his life. I was lucky enough to be his pal, oh, that's awesome. and um, I, I was certainly at the Fari convention. Ed, but also, um, I would go down. Ray never. I think technically he learned to drive, but he never wanted to drive. Um, yeah, he was so, in a wheelchair in those last. Years. Well, he was in. A, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, he wasn't going to be driving then. No, it's a funny but he, one. He but he never did. He had a driver. He had. A, he had. Um, mm. A guy called Patrick, who was a lovely guy, who um, was Ray's driver. And for nearly a decade, um, Ray and I and Dennis would go down with Pat. Patrick would drive us to the San Diego Comic Con. And then, uh, and also Ray's editor, Jen Brell, is a very close friend of mine as well. So sometimes, anyway. Edit oh, cool. this to make it's sense a nice of it. Long drive with sure, <laughs> it is a long drive, but 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 Ray would keep talking, you know. So he was full of stories. <laughs> How cool! How cool! Old LA style, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Yes, that's what he wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about Clifton's cafeteria and hanging out with Harryhausen and mm-hmm. Fari Ackerman. Oh yeah, three, I, some of three teenage video. friends, you know, who who became the masters of uh, right of of our crazy little universe you know since we're dropping names how about professor codman's punch and judy do you recall that <laughs> um yeah punch and judy um especially professor codman's they yeah. did franchise the name out oh, did so they? you know you can't yeah you can't be entirely sure mm. who you saw doing the show oh, right. but um to our american listeners H- jose is Referring to something that's probably fairly unfamiliar to most people, right? European, uh-huh. most pretty obscure. Yeah, it, it's it's a kids puppet show, and by puppet show we mean a tiny TARDIS on the outside sized mm-hmm. tent that would be set up out of doors. TARDIS, and, and it would be it would look like a beautiful little Victorian theater um, with hand puppets. Yeah. They doing horrible dis- things to each other. They did horrible things to each <laughs> other. Yeah. But vaguely descended from the Commedia dell'arte characters. Punch is essentially Pulcinello mm-hmm. from the Commedia, which can tie us back into Dog Company at some point if I ever stop rambling. And um, Bloodline. And, yeah, sure. Yes, sure. exactly. Um, but Punch and Judy were a children's entertainment that involved um, – Murder, cannibalism, 
hints of bestiality. Um, people Slicing, get hung, get beaten yeah. over the head, get fed to <laughs> like crocodiles. Grand Guignol. It was Grand Guignol for kids. <laughs> it was Grand Guignol for kids. It absolutely was. Yeah. And um, and the thing is, to, you know, and Mr. Punch was a very bad man, and he did mm -hmm. these terrible things. There was no doubt whose side the kids were on. <laughs> when we yelled with glee, it was for Mr. Punch and his stick because he beat people to death with a stick. Yes. And, and, his, and his tagline was, and Mr. Punch had this weird little, whoever was doing it, would have this little kind of squeaky puppet voice. Mm. And his tagline was, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. And he would <laughs> hit somebody over the head and look to us, and we would all shout, that's the way to do it! Yeah. <laughs> As he murdered people. <laughs> Violence. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because so, for, for American audiences, I don't think they ever got, uh, uh, they had like Howdy Doody Cowboy and stuff like that, which was much more wholesome, much more... Uh, right, he wasn't going around shooting his wife no. and hanging no. policemen, right? Yeah, In we, Portugal, I, only read I still about remember. It. Yeah. In Portugal, I still remember seeing uh, kind of the Portuguese version of Punch and Judy, which, of course, oh, has sure. the, the guy shows up with a stick. And in our case, it was toma, 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 toma. It would just hit the guy. <laughs> That's um, great. Yeah. It was just, yeah. When I was like in fourth, fifth grade, you know, there were still like little shows like that that were being done in school. And and it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. So that was the the, the mercy the mercy side that's that was your experience how about the mercy beat what were you listening to uh when did you start making music oh well not till the 70s obviously because i, okay. I was a kid but um just th this is not a correction in any way but just just so you know um in locally it's a soft s so mm -hmm. it's mercy not mercy, mercy. um you know, so it's a Mersey beat, Mersey side, big deal. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I, well, yes, again, that, that that decade of the 60s, I was growing up when Mersey beat, particularly yeah. the Beatles, but a few others were like conquering the world. Um, and we, uh, we had a pop star living on our street, this little blue collar terrace street. Uh, we lived in number six and in number seven were the Greens. Mr. and Mrs. Green and their teenage daughter Irene, mm -hmm. who <laughs> was, but nobody called her Irene Green because she was Tiffany long before the oh. the eighties American pop star Tiffany. She took oh, the name wow. Tiffany, and uh, she had a band and she played the cabin and she was signed by Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager. Oh, and, there you go. I mean Tiffany never quote made it, but. Um, Except but for she was cool Hellra as fuck. Hellraiser. She looked. She's like a female Stuart Sutcliffe, big bouffant hair, black sunglasses, all leather. So, just the, the fact that like Mersey Beat felt very home to me because it's like, yeah, yeah, Tiffany lives on our street. Mm. Um, you can find on YouTube. I think there are. Uh, there's a couple of clips of Tiffany. Oh. Brian Epstein made her a little more respectable. Like, she's not in the black leather. She's um, it's a bit like Stella Black. She has a nicer Mary Quant style and a pretty frock. Sure. Um, but but technically, you know, there's footage out there. So Excellent. But, but yeah, yeah. That, that was all around. It's a, it's a very musical city. Um, Liverpool is, as I'm, like a lot of blue-collar towns, and especially perhaps maritime towns, riverside towns in the States, um, working class people are doomed to a life on the factory floor unless they get out via sports or music. Now, obviously, you can also get out through art and literature generally or education sure. yourself, but the the instinctive escape routes were um, football, boxing, or rock and roll. Mm. Right. Um, so it's always had a very healthy and busy musical scene. We're all ethnically Irish as well, so um, it's got that Irish, Celtic, uh, sure. Baratic influence going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't start playing music until the mid, early 70s. 
Okay. okay. So I was uh, technically, and again, it, was, it wasn't as big a scene in the U.S. Technically, I was a, a glam rock kid, mm -hmm. which means th the most famous one here was David Bowie. Um, uh, there was also T-Rex, Roxy Music, Cotton yeah. Rebel. Mark oh, Bowen. Well, yeah, well known pedophile and felon Gary Glitter. We oh, my God. Yeah. We didn't know at the time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You um, mentioned Roxy Music in one of your stories. I think it was about the girl in the moon. And I went yeah. and listened to Roxy Music right after that. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's great. Having Thank an, you. Two friends are having an argument about Roxy Music and T-Rex. and well, yeah. That was me and my best friend Terry. Um, that was that was based on fact. Terry was my best friend all through high school, and he he was a what well, I'm sure you'll know this. He was a prog rock guy. He yeah. liked Pink Floyd and King Crimson and the Moody Blues, and I was so do I. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. man, my, my wife Sarah, she's a huge prog rock fan. Her right. favorite band is Rush. So oh, yeah. oh awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so that was Terry's thing, and I had – I was the glam rock kid. And we, as friends do, we would just inflict this shit on each other. Like, you know, when adults <laughs> try to do that, we just say, oh, no, thanks, Jose. That's not for me. And mm -hmm. nobody's offended. But as teenagers, it's like, no, you sit your friend down and you make him listen to this album yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah. of to stuff. Convert, you try, yeah. Exactly. Try to you try, you try <laughs> to persuade – and as I, the reason I put the line in that story, thank you for mentioning it, is um, that's literally what happened. Um, I couldn't quite persuade him that T-Rex were great, and he couldn't quite persuade me that Pink Floyd were great. And then Roxy Music arrived, and they satisfied both, both forms. They were very much an art house band, um, but they weren't long and meandering. They, they were prog rock in three-minute chunks, and they were very stylish and funny and glamorous. Um, <laughs> so, so, it, so we could both like them. And in fact, one of the lovely things about that sort of teenage friendship and argument is, of course, it worked. The truth is, Terry ended up loving T-Rex, and I ended up loving Pink Floyd, but you can't admit it to the guy. <laughs> you know, like at the time, it's like fuck that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, that's and, then, the kind and decades of thing that later, you think, oh man, writing. remember when Terry used to play me Dark Side of the Moon? Whoa, that's great. So, so it, you know, it works. You, that's you, the kind of you thing I love do. about your writing is that right in the middle of a story like that, it just hits me. You know, it just strikes home. You know, because you know, it's very. I don't know what to say. It's it gets you you know and i just went and listened to that kind of music right after i heard that so story well that that's the greatest compliments anybody can pay people who write stories ed thank you i mean that's great that's great if things because you know look we all love the gore that's what brought us <laughs> <Yeah>. here <laughs> but you know if things can make a reader or a viewer you know whether it's books mm -hmm. or movies uh, you want to appeal to all the emotions. Yeah, if you can if you can make people cry, if you can make people laugh, if you can inspire them to go and listen to music. Um, yeah, that, you, that's what you want to do. That's that's what Thank we all you. come for, Thank you, right? Pete. Thank you, uh, for, you for the gift. And you said there was a story that brought you almost to tears, and uh, and I had a story that made me want to get a shot of vodka because I was just feeling chills <laughs> afterwards. Uh, it was that uh, the the girl um, on the moon, the blue the, volcano. No, no, the the oh, under between the, the cold moon and the earth. Between the cold moon and the earth. Thank oh, you. That, that one. That one. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, Amazing. Thanks. Mm. Thank you, Jose. This so, that's great. Thank so you. So when did you start writing? Was it around high school time? Or I'm, I'm sure I wrote bad poetry in high school, uh -huh. like everybody did. Like um, everybody does. Lyrics. I, I, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, right. Terrible lyrics. Terrible. I mean, I, I was the band I later went on to actually, you know, to have a real band that played real gigs. This is not that band. I was in a, a band in '73, um, still at high school. Um, and we sucked, you know, like like everybody's <laughs> first band does. Um, and and one of the areas we sucked hardest was in my lyrics. Because, <laughs> like hey, at no. least you weren't just cover bands, you know, like cover bands are a dime a yeah, dozen. We you know why? Because we weren't good enough. We, we couldn't learn other people's songs. It was a lot easier. 
to what, what was your uh, to band? Just rise our own bad <laughs> shit. Whatever what, it takes. What was that band called? <sighs> God, <laughs> you remember? <laughs> yeah. Well, at our very first gig, and by gig I mean in the assembly hall at high school, um, we were called. And actually, I like this more. The very first time we played, we were called Dyke Siren and the Police Cars. <laughs> and um, and Dyke did not yet, in our innocent little minds, have the connotation oh, of yeah, lesbian. Yeah, sure. It was, I think, it was a. I think I meant Deke. It was meant to just sound like a tough guy American name. And I oh, think I might funny. have been half remembering oh, no. Deke, oh, and no. I called it Dyke. Dyke <laughs> Siren and the Police Cars. Oh, wow. um, That's hilarious. Um, Blame it on the Scouse accent. Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. But cool. um, and then we went out. We we actually did get a few gigs. We played some pubs under the curious name of Amanda Revel. Wow! There was no Amanda <laughs> in the band. It was an all male band. Mm-hmm. Um, with makeup I, and glam. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. That oh. was that. That was a glam rock band, and we were no leotards though. Say again. No, no, no leotards. leotards. No. Okay. O- only Freddie did the leotards. <laughs> that Fred came Fred later in the dog company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We did all that in the dog company, sure. No, naked sure. there. <laughs> Bunch of pervs. We did everything. Um, we were vaguely glad. I, 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 I remember having black nail polish and false eyelashes, but I insisted on false eyelash only on one eye so that like, I could be like Alex, or... so I could be a little droogy, you mm. know. Yeah. So we wanted to be pretty, <laughs> but tough. Um, and I think they were called Amanda Revel because I loved Roxy Music's first single, Virginia Plain. And there was a, a character in an Agatha Christie novel called Virginia Revel. Mm. And I thought, oh, we could call ourselves Virginia Revel. No, that's too close to Virginia Plain. So I'll pick another girl's name with three syllables, Amanda Revel. So that, <laughs> right. anyway. Fortunately, <laughs> all evidence of Amanda Revel has been lost to history. There are no recordings. I don't think I don't even have photographs. Um, <laughs> but it's all buried in your backyard. Yeah, that that it's sounds. I was going to say backyard. that sounds deliberate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it w- if I could find it, it would be deliberate. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> I would get rid of that. So, how does all this stuff start unfolding in high school? Then you. you, you I know you met Clyde Barker in high school, right? But but you were already pretty culturally, you know, driven, and you were you were sure. doing stuff, right? Uh, I, I was I was in fact doing that stuff. In fact, the, the how Clive and I met, and again, I apologize to the hardcore fans and listeners. I know I've told these stories before, um, so I'll try. But I also know there are people who won't have heard them before. So it's always yeah. you want to try and make them as quick as possible. So as not to, but the reason Clive and I met was Amanda Revel. Um, oh. That band was a high school band, and we uh, we'd had somebody anyway. I found a kid two years younger than me, who somebody told me played drums, and I just the way you can at that age. I just walked up to him and said, "Hey Bickley, you're in our group. You're playing drums." <laughs> and, uh, and his name was Graham Bickley, who went on to be uh, a TV star in in England years oh, wow. later. Yeah. But um, after playing with us a few times, we became genuine friends. And and he said to me, "You should meet my sister's friend Clive. He's like you. He reads books." <laughs> and um, <laughs> and that was it. Like you know, you. That was that was <laughs> yeah. sufficient. Yeah. Um, so it was. It was. It was. That was exactly how Clive and I met through what we'd just been talking about, and we met in Allen Library, and um, I met Doug the same day. They had been rehearsing. They. They are, as you know, much older than me. So <laughs> they. They were already out, out of high school. In fact, out of college, and they were rehearsing in a local <laughs> college. I am Marsh College. And Clive and I hit it off immediately, so I went trotting off with him to this college to meet Doug and Julie and Phil and whoever else was in it. And Graham's sister, Sue, was still with sure. him at that point. So that was how that came about. And, and yeah, you're right, Jose. I was already 
desperately interested in the world of the arts without really knowing how to access it other than, as I say, because I had that blue collar attitude of um, you either learn to box or you play rock and roll. Mm. But I still had the thing that they grind working class people down with this notion that to be a writer or an actor or a playwright or a filmmaker, that's, it's an entirely other world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and one of the great things about Clive is that he was certainly not just for me, but for many people, I think he was the, in my case, he was the first person I met who not in these words, but essentially said, fuck that. We, we, we can, we can do whatever we want that, that the world is open to us. Mm. We will make theater. We will make films. We'll do these things. Look at me. I draw, I write. So it was, um, it so wasn't. It, really it wasn't was, a search for. Uh, it wasn't so much a search for an occupation as so much a, a way to express yourself more freely. Oh yeah, we had no illusion it would ever be an occupation. Right. <laughs> no. And yet a, here we are. Nobody yeah. made a living from this shit. Yeah. That wasn't. Right. Uh, as he says from his home in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. From his rented apartment, you know. But uh, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, no, that was. Um, it. It was true and remains true, I think, for most people who make that decision to run away with the circus or whatever metaphor of choice mm -hmm. you want. Um, you really, if your reason for doing that is, hey, I'll be a star and make a lot of money, it might happen. And right. God bless you and good luck to you. Um, if that's the reason for doing it, you're in for a sad ride, <laughs> you know, because because yeah. the odds, the odds against. Well, I mean, there are various levels of achievement and success, and right. all I'm saying is you should do it for the for your own sake, for the sake of your mental health. You should do it for the love of the thing. You should do right. it because you want to run away and join the circus. It's like that. That's what I want to do. I want to, in one way or another, right. spend my life on stage. You sure. Know, I mean, I, there's people who have dreams, and and it's wonderful to have dreams, right? But but if you don't have talent, or if you don't want to invest the time into honing your craft, I mean, a dream is just a dream. It's going to be an empty promise. That uh, it, it's up to you to make it happen. And if some people think they can just I'm going to serve tables in L.A. or I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to become a, 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 g a gigantic right. HBO stand up comedian. And it's like, well, if you don't put in the if you don't have the calling for it, if you don't have the talent, if you sure. don't want to put in honing your craft, uh, of course, you're just going to end up serving tables for five years and being like, well, it didn't happen to me. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely right. And certainly if your only motivation and drive is I'll be rich and famous. Well, first of all, fuck off. You know, get out of our world. <laughs> yeah. um, because the world should be reserved for people who love this stuff and want to do it. Yeah. But secondly, as you say, Jose, it's unlikely to happen unless, although, let's face it, the world is not fair. And I'm sure there are, in fact, many rich and famous, utterly talentless assholes. I'm oh. sure we could name some sure. if, we, if we wanted to. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of a lottery. You can yeah. you can have it. And also, I would like to say, I know we're being light, but um, you could also be Van Gogh. And, uh, you know, there's no doubt about his talent, but there's no doubt he... That he's missing an ear. <laughs> he's missing an ear and missing, <laughs> missing wealth and fame. You know, like yeah. it didn't... It, in this sense, it didn't happen for him. He's still waiting tables. You know, by the yeah. time he died, he'd sold one painting. Um, so I, ju I just want to make that little asterisk to what you said is all so that it's like. Um, it, do it for the right reasons. Do it for the right reasons. And please, God, it works out for you, of course. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't work out for you. Please God, you're Van Gogh, you know, and and it, and it works out <laughs> later, and people remember you. Yeah. Whatever. In posterity. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Van Gogh. A, I guess a bit of a downer now. Let's let's take a minute and think about the sad unfurnace. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
we're, we'll get to this later in the episode, but I just want to let you know there are a whole bunch of people who are interested in throwing some questions into the hat. So we'll get to those sure. later. But there are some really good questions here. So I think our, our listeners and particularly your fans are mm-hmm. are kind of doing the work for us. Um, God but bless yes. You. Yeah. <laughs> but so <laughs> – so the, the dog company is where it takes off, right? So that and then the 70s and, you know, eventually New World knocks on the door and, and Hellraiser happens, right? Right. Yeah. And um, – Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the word. Now read on. You know. Yeah. Um, um, I, let me see. Let me see if there's a question here about that because there are some interesting things. Um, for example – I have a John Palisano question here that I think would would be useful. It says, in so much of Peter's work, there's an intriguing melancholy mix of poetics and unflinching violence. Any insight Mm -hmm. into how these two opposites developed and melded together so successfully for you? Jeez. John, it's 11.30 in the morning. (laughs) Give me a break. Um, Punch and Judy is is a good throwback to that. Sure. Uh, (laughs) Well, y- yes, but actually, can, can I just say for for those who mightn't know, um, John uh, is himself a, a writer of some renown and multiple oh, Stoker you know Award him. winner. He's you know. the current president of uh, the HWA, the Horror Writers Association, oh. and, um, oh. and and is also a great guy who who lives in LA, not far from here. Oh. So um, that's so that's very nice of him cool. to. Uh, Ask a question. To Probably. ask a question. Yeah. Although it's not so nice of him to ask a, a, an intellectually challenging one. Um, <laughs> it's making well, you work. on your toes. Well, a, a melancholy mix of poetics and unflinching violence. <laughs> oh, God. First of all, John, if you listen. Wow. My next book, it's fucking great. <laughs> Maybe I'll put melancholy before. I'll ask him if I can say a mix of melancholy poetics and unflinching <laughs> violence. John yep. Palisano, comma, president of the Horror Writers Association. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a great, yeah. Great, great. Quote. great, great so, great, thank you, John. Let me attempt to answer yeah. it. Liverpool. Liverpool is a mix of melancholy poetics and unflinching mm. violence. Um,. That's kind of true, by the way. That's so. I think it might well be that might be that might be an environmental thing. Um, it's you know, it's it's a tough little working class town with a lot of well, we call them tough guys here. We call them hard men or hard knocks. Uh, at least when I was growing up, um, and there's some you know, some scary motherfuckers in Liverpool. Um, and when the violence came, it was unflinching. So, like Alex um, and Midrugis. Yeah, right. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we had a. I, I from a neighborhood called Wavertree, and there was a gang of skinheads called the Wavertree Clan. And uh, if you saw the clan come in, you'd fucking run because <laughs> they did not take any prisoners, especially because uh, I did. I was not a skinhead, you know. I was so they would have been. They would have been delighted to. But I was fast. Um, <laughs> but also, but actually, I mentioned it earlier. The other thing is that, like Boston and many another American town, Liverpool is essentially ethnically Irish. Mm-hmm. So, just the very phrase "melancholy poetics," well, that's Ireland in a nutshell, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's W. B. Yeats, that man is in love and loves what vanishes. <laughs> Living in a tower, wandering through hollow. You know, it's like yeah. boom, Celtic yeah. twilight. So I think there is something in, I don't know whether I buy geography and environment as, as a big influence on artists, but it's probably a thing. Oh, sure. So I think that Celtic melancholy um, is probably a natural for people from Liverpool and certainly you know, not to practice unflinching violence, but perhaps to be unblinking in the face of violence, to look at it and say, oh, that's what happens. Um, so actually, I, w- I was kind of kidding. I, w- I was looking for a cheap joke answer when I said <laughs> Liverpool is the answer to that question. 
but it kind of is. Hmm. <laughs> it kind of is, I think. Um, and Great. then if, if we want to widen it out... Um, it, it's I'll Liverpool, the the, fa- the source of life, and also the name itself, Puddle of Mud. So, you know, there right. you go. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah. If people don't know, Jose is referencing a famous quote of Carl Jung. Mm-hmm. Um, the philosopher, do we call him a philosopher? I mean, I know technically he was a he's sure. the father of psycho and um, one of the fathers. Let's call him a thinker. Yeah. He's, he's a thinker. Yes, he, he's a well-known thinker. As months, you probably think what I say. Ah, Carl Young, a well-known thinker, had this. To say. <laughs> um, he said, "Liverpool is the pool of life," which is lovely, and etymologically complete bullshit. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's in a Jungian sense, it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's that, uh, and also I, I think. Um, it's a real compliment from John, and, and I thank him very much for it. And I think any artist, visual, literary, musical, whatever, you owe you owe your art and the world uh, an unblinking stare, right? So, um, so I think you're going if you, if you feel at all, <laughs> you're going to try and be poetic, and you're going to be a bit melancholy. And if um, if you think at all, you're going to say, "Jesus, the world's a cruel place," yeah. um, and you're going to they they're going to both be in the mix, I guess. You know, sure. But it's, it's very nice. It's very nice that he thinks I mix them well. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and that that reminds me of um, Morningstar because I I that just got re released as an audio book, right, with Doug Bradley, whose face sure. is on the wall yeah. there behind you. And uh, and I so I just got finished listening to that here uh, last week. I was just listening to it also. Yeah, and and uh, the one thing that you know, and that really really made me think because I'd never I'd never read it before. So this was my first time, and and at first I'm cheering for the the vampire hunter, right? And sure. and uh, and about midway the through matador. the book. Yeah, and midway and, through the and book, then he you start does that thinking terrible thing to that nice girl, and you think, "Wait a minute!" Yeah, and you start <laughs> thinking, "I shouldn't be cheering for this guy, right? He's not, you know, this right. is." And and then philosophically, later on, it gets into, uh, you know, what is a vampire hunter? It's somebody who hates people who are different from himself. If you know, I don't believe art should ever be predicated on subtext. But if the subtext emerges, there it yeah. is. Um, and yeah, clearly, I think I was um, the notion of otherizing people, yeah. of attacking the other, does seem to be, if we're honest, the basis for for all those fantastic vampire hunters that we love, that we grow up loving. Yeah. We're totally on Peter Cushing's side. In uh, in the Hammer Dracula, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, or Blade, but it's, right? <laughs> yeah, and Blade, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well, it helps when when the when the vampires are portrayed. They're scumbags, no yeah. In, in Blade, yeah, the comic book or the guys. movie, yeah. but when they are one note monsters, it's like yeah. great. We need a fucking vigilante. <laughs> yeah. Give him his stake. Get him out there and let him take care of it. <laughs> yeah. But in what I what I was hoping to do, at least in Morningstar, was, you know, well, how would how would that vampire hunter function in a world of ambiguity in which yeah. what is a vampire? What does it mean? Are they yeah. bad, good, morally indifferent? Is he just what's the difference between a vampire hunter and a lunatic psychopath? Yeah. Um, and Not much. No, <laughs> no, none at yeah. all. Because vampires don't exist. But. Um, Although Ramsey you know, Campbell has had a run-in with um, some nut job in the north of England who fancies himself a vampire hunter. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> and, and nothing thrills Ramsey more than puncturing the lunatic pretensions <laughs> of, uh, of the delusional. <laughs> so, but anyway. He's the Harry Houdini of the vampire hunter. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> Um, but you know what was great too is in in Morningstar was you must have gone to the Hyatt Regency Hotel right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, because it's so well described. I mean, I'm blind now, but I've been there many times, and I was yeah. like, oh, he's got to have been there before. Right. You know? 
Oh, well, th thank you, Ed. I mean, it, yeah, I'd, I'd been, I'm trying to think when I, I'd been to the U.S. once in 1978, but it was to visit a friend I'd been at college with uh, who lived in Redwood, well, his parents lived in Redwood City. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in the Bay Area, you know, I go to Redwood. Yeah, right, right exactly. Okay, well, well, my first my first trip to the U.S., Ed, was, was Redwood City, which I'm sure you're familiar hey, with. Hey, Pete. Sure. Now, going yeah, back to to the vampire hunter thing, it, it's yeah. uh, another subversive moment that's kind of similar. Is the Omega Man, like the Richard Matheson, oh, when the, yeah, yeah. the vampire hunter is actually seen as the monster, right? Uh, there's a little bit of that in there because he's the one. Everybody else is now the norm, and he's the one who goes out at right. daytime killing and them, terrorizes them. Yeah, he's yeah. the thing yeah. that you know. He, he's the equivalent to us of the thing that comes in the night. Yeah. And kills us when we're helpless. Right. Yeah. But he, your vampires, is, you know, spoilers, you know, they can walk around in the daylight and, you know, they don't fear crosses and they don't like, you know, yeah. holy water doesn't bother them. No, they're, they're just sexually deviant. And I think that's what is driving. <laughs> that's they're like werewolves more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They well, just like weird shit, you know. And and, like and again, animalistic a, sex. And there's a point right. in the book where you start thinking, is this guy just crazy? And there really aren't any vampires, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he chopped her head off awful quick, you know. Well, there yes. is a moment where he shows Donovan Moon a guy and shows him the the, the vampire teeth. There are right? fangs. So yeah, there are yeah. fangs. So. There are fangs. Yeah, though, but course, was that just somebody but, with a bad you know, diarrhea or something? You know, it's like <laughs> well, yeah. that or, or cosmetic surgery. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I remember there were back in back in the around then the late eighties. There was a magazine and a, a loose group called the Velvet Vampires in London, who were mm. sort of proto goth chicks, sure. and they were all these like really hot, <laughs> really mm. attractive um, girls who were very working the goth look. Yeah, yeah it, it was it was a little pre goth. Well, I want to say pre goth, Not maybe it goth. wasn't, but anyway, Victorian goth, proto goth. Yes, yes, <laughs> and. The lady who was the like chairperson, and I'm so sorry to say I can't remember her name, because I'm 65 and this shit goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll remember as soon as pass. we hang up. But um, I met her at a convention, and we we had friends in common. And the friend that was, she showed me her fangs. Nice. And she had fangs. Now clearly, it was she'd paid a friendly dentist to provide those fangs. Oh, they weren't in a box. <laughs> no, no, not then. No. That would defeat the purpose. <laughs> As she's about my age, they might be in a box now. <laughs> oh, or a glass. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, That's... so it's interesting. You know, the, the book is nearly 30 years old, so there's nothing I can That's do why about I don't mind it now. spoilers, right? <laughs> but um, I probably should have been, I should have floated the possibility that that even that could be a cosmetic choice because I did want to keep it. Of course. I think the reader does. The sense of, what what, is, what is it that he's is killing? What, what is it that these people are yeah, doing? You know? Yeah. 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 I think the reader isn't sure, you know, when the, when all is said and done, because the beam of light coming down into the higher. Oh, well, that's all real. <laughs> that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What was well, going on there? Is that aliens? I mean, you know, <laughs> No, but, uh, that's that. That is that is the universe deciding to step on this fucking insect who's going around killing people yeah. just once. It's just it's that Woody Allen moment in the line in in the cinema line in Annie Hall, and here's some asshole going on about something, blah blah blah, and Marshall oh, McLuhan's theories. The yeah, and, the guy in and, line at the movie theater. Yeah, exactly. And Woody says, "Oh my God, this guy. He knows nothing about Marshall McLuhan." And the guy says, I happen to be a college professor. I'm paraphrasing very badly, Woody. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I happen to be a college professor who teaches a course in Marshall McLuhan. And Woody says, again, in a great sort of meta moment. Um, yeah, side says, oh, to the really? Because I happen to have Marshall McLuhan right here. And he walks <laughs> Marshall McLuhan into shot. And Marshall McLuhan says, you know, nothing about my theories and walks out. <laughs> and Woody turns to the camera and says, if only life were like this. 
<laughs> and, and sorry, yeah. long-winded way yeah. of saying, if only life were like this, if, yeah. if psychotic vigilantes could be stepped on yeah. by the goddess. Or there was a, in, a, was it yeah. in Everville, I think, that uh, that Tesla said, I just talked to Jesus this morning and your name didn't come up or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, he, he could write a pithy line when he puts his mind to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the monsters in some of your stories are usually um, – the, the universe itself is kind of manifesting. It's almost like a, also a, a – there's also a manifestation of the cosmos itself in the stories like uh, uh, Little Beat Girl uh, where – it's it's the monster, so to speak, the fallen angel is is causing the universe itself to glitch out the multiverse. Right. And then the the universe itself finds a way of correcting himself by also making people disappear and stuff. And in that case, it's also like sticking its thumb down and saying, oh, this is malfunctioning. I'm just going to destroy that and make sure it right. never existed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Look at that thematic consistency. I, who knew? <laughs> I, 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 yeah. It may it's just be all in I, my head. I haven't. I. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it's very cinematic too. It's like no wonder you're such a good filmmaker, script yeah. writer. You know, it well, reads very you. quickly. It reads very quickly, and especially now that Encyclopocalypse Publications has made this wonderful audio book with Doug Bradley. Yeah, um, sure. So, it, 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 oh yeah, no, I mean that's. I'm. I'm so. You know. I totally I mean, as as a I'm sorry, Ryan. Say oh, again. go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that made that made me picture uh, Doug Bradley as Morningstar. Oh, and, oh yeah, and then I pictured yeah. oh, yeah, well, yeah, and, and I, I pictured you as Donovan Moon. Yes, oh, wow. yeah, and yes. <laughs> But our younger self. Right? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I'm picturing San Francisco yeah. like the Zodiac Although, murder. It would be show. kind of hilarious to uh, to film that. You know, that, that long. Basically, a third of the book is essentially a conversation between Moon and Frost. Yeah. So um, that would be funny to uh, to film it with me and Doug now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Get a bar in San Francisco. Not getting out of our chairs fast enough and saying, no, we, uh, what's your fucking name? Oh. <laughs> um, well, well, yeah, well, Jonathan yes, Frost. Well, Doug, Doug, Doug would have been a great Jonathan Frost. Yeah, I mean, I mean both of those guys Doug. are, you know, Jonathan yeah. Frost in his forties and Moon's in his thirties, so yeah. so not now. But um, yeah, no, Doug, Doug would be would be great. Well, Doug's great, you know. It yeah. would be. It was. I, it was, it I was picture a foil you both to have as him. your younger selves wearing your brim, you know, your forties style brim hat and stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's... how, how well, did they approach you? Uh, how did um, the, the cycle... for, for the for the listeners? Ed's referring to the hat that I wear on the Rolling Darkness Review YouTube channel to read the stories, which is just a nod to when Glenn and I did the live shows as these characters, uh, Algie Black and Artie Mac, we were um, suspenders and fedoras was, was their look. So, um, oh, and, and for our UK listeners, don't get excited. Suspenders means braces, not garter belts. <laughs> you have to be very, very clear about that. Yeah, aren't garters suspenders? Oh, in, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. To, to, if you tell yeah. an English listener, yeah. oh, they're wearing suspenders, yeah. what they hope is that you're talking about Ariana Grande, yeah. not a 64-year-old fat author. Uh, uh, because or like the, suspenders or like your, means uh, your garter belts. We call those things braces, uh, the, you know, the things that mm -hmm. hold your pants up. It's uh, like that people. line in Hellbound when Julia says, all we need now is skin, and everybody in the UK goes, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, this is weird. This must, uh, This is so inside baseball. Uh, but I, I assume most of your listeners are not casually interested, right? Yeah, the, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's okay. pretty niche. So, yeah. We are listening to the yeah, Clive Barker podcast. Yeah, so because <laughs> this is very inside baseball to, to pick on weird little things like this. But it was odd. It must be regional because um, what the line I'd actually written on a manual typewriter, by the way, that, that's how long ago <laughs> oh. it was, uh, 
You're, yeah, no shit. Yeah. I want possibly the last movie to have been written on a manual typewriter. Who knows? <laughs> um, anyway, the, 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 the line was, all we need now is a skin, a skin. All we need now is a skin. Yeah. Um, meaning within the world of Hellraiser, clearly, you know, get a skin on me and we're good to go. Yeah. Meaning a human skin. Right. And Claire said uh, on the day we were going to shoot it, well, I can't really say that, can I? And I said, what do you mean? Why not? And she, sort of gave, <laughs> and she gave this saucy right. grin and said, well, you know. Prophylactic. And, yeah, and I said, I, I, I don't. And I think she said Johnny, which was a slang yeah, for the condoms when we were kids. <laughs> I, I don't... I did right. not want to uh, put incorrect words in clear, but it was something like that. She said, well, it's, well, it's a Johnny. Um, and I said, it is because <laughs> it, it had never been where I came from. Oh, okay. A skin was not slang for condom. That's interesting. But she said, yeah, no, it totally is. Well, they make natural condoms out of a well, they, cheap skin. Right. You know? It made perfect sense when she said it, but it would it, it had gone right over my head. I, so, I, um, but anyway, we're talking so about she, braces. She dropped the A yeah. in the hope that people would then hear it. Uh, okay. uh, all right. we need now is skin. Right. Um, I, I, I grew up with uh, calling those little cheap $2 uh, sandals thongs. Right. Uh, oh, so you wear thongs, you jellies? Yeah, yeah, thongs on your feet. But but it, then then I moved to Alaska and it's like oh, thong. That's like the little. Really? You were, you wear thongs? Yeah. yeah. Right. In so Alaska. but they, they everybody calls them flip flops. <laughs> yeah. And they look right. good on yeah. me, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody right. nobody calls them thongs <laughs> as far as I know anywhere right. anymore. Right. But a G string for a woman is also a thong. Right. 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 So it's like suspenders and braces. You have to be careful, yeah, Ryan, yeah. when you tell and people, Bing I'm, brings I'm just going to slip into my to thongs. The and they say, no, don't. don't. Yeah. <laughs> and but anyway, I'm bringing it back to suspenders slash um, yeah, uh, uh, braces <laughs> because you guys play hard-boiled characters. So, you know, you got that look down, right? You got that 40s, 50s kind of look for the show. For the show, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But wait a, minute. Also, wait, um, wait a minute, what about the, other, the, the suspenders other... and the braces in the Hyatt Regency hotel room scene where she doesn't take them off? And he, she says, um, if you were older, you'd have thought that was oh. thrilling. You know, I, I just we just heard that part. And I was thinking, Doug is reading this sex scene. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Though that was weird. I, <laughs> you know, it's a long time. As I say, the book's nearly 30 years old. And um and yes, that, that occurred to me too. I, I mean, before I heard it, you know, I just thought, oh yeah, that's weird. There's a big sex scene right in the middle of that book. Huh. I, want, I wonder how Doug's going to handle it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he handled it with his usual aplomb. You know, yeah. it, was, it was fine. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah. People are going to uh, love that who don't know that there's a big sex scene that Doug reads. You know. <laughs> yes. Here's the hardcover from Morningstar. Yeah. Oh, here we go. And I got a version signed by you oh, in yay. green ink. In is, green ink. That's fine. Yeah, it is. Well, and I believe that is the very bottle of Levenger. What's it called? Gemstone green. Wow. <laughs> right. does, does, no it look like fount, does it look like fountain pen ink or just green? It, it looks like I got it, lazy later. It looks like it glitters <laughs> in the light. It looks like what? It, it looks glitters. like it glitters. Yeah. That's fountain oh, penny. that must yeah, yeah. brilliant. Got to be Yay. good. Yeah, right. It's uh, it's magic. It glitters in the light. <laughs> so um, how cool! That's great, Joe. Huh. So, so how did uh, Encyclo Encyclopocalypse approach you for this and get you and Doug together? You guys are in touch with each other, or was this like getting back in touch? What was that like? Oh no, no, Doug and I are still in touch, of course. Yeah, I mean, we, okay. you know, he lives in. Um, uh, Pittsburgh? Not Philadelphia. Phil Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah, <laughs> I always get it mixed up. He lives in Pittsburgh now, so you know, obviously we don't we don't hang out on on a regular basis. But um, 
uh, you know, we text, <laughs> we phone. <laughs> He and comes he comes into, out for it. And he com- exactly. And he comes into town for Lollapalooza, M- Monster Palooza, and yeah. Son of Monster Palooza, and, um, and all those things. So we've never been out of out touch. Of touch yeah. But um, of am I giving you an echo now? Have we no. got in the same way? Sounds no, good. It sounds good. Oh, yeah. maybe it was just at my end. Um, I'm freaking out now about this Lynchian ghost that escapes <laughs> my body occasionally. <laughs> he, he's gone. Um, <laughs> yeah, for now, right? Yeah. For now. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Um, it is Halloween, after all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no. So, so we never, we were never out of touch. But you know, I, as you get older and live in different parts of the world, and Doug was stayed in the UK for decades, as you know. Of course. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we would often go a year without speaking, um, and then. We'd see each other. It would be like nothing had happened, and then we'd go six months without. You know, you know the way it is with with the old. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, so we were still very much in touch, and it was my idea to have him read it. I, I'll I'll try and make it. I can't make anything brief. I apologize. <laughs> Thank um, you, John. That's cool. M- Mark Miller, who, as as you guys know, had yeah. run Clive's company for him for a long time, Seraphim. Right. Um, he launched in Psychopocalypse. Um, I mean, they do it all now. They're doing ebooks and trade paperbacks as well. But it was strictly an audio book company in, in his head when he first formed it a couple of years ago. And uh, he and I had met. I mean, I'd, I'd been aware of him, obviously, because he'd been Clive's guy. Um, but we hadn't actually met until Paul Kane introduced us on the mm-hmm. Queen Mary at uh, at the Stoker convention, the Horror Rises wow. convention. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. That must so, have been really, yeah, so it's, really it's, awesome. It's, it's, it's always handy to, you know, if you meet somebody at a landmark place, it's like, oh, I know where I met Mark. It was the Queen Mary. Yeah. Oh, um, cool. And we, we hit it off immediately. Um, and so he, I mean, I can't remember. You know, we, <laughs> we were talking or texting, and he said, want to do some books and and i said sure oh hold on one second just the cursor it's fucking haunted i'm telling you the (laughs) cursor just migrated onto the video icon uh and the box came up that said turn video off so the ghost is speaking to me again (laughs) the box um (laughs) but so he said you want to do it and i was um so i Unfortunately, the lockdown has put a stall on a lot of the projects because I, I was doing, uh, I was recording Big Thunder and Rumors of the Marvelous myself down uh-huh. at Mark's studio in Long Beach. Um, but we can't do that right now. Um, but fortunately, I'd had the brilliant and exploit my past idea of asking Doug to do Morningstar. I thought I could do Big Thunder, but you know, if I if I could get Pinhead to uh, yeah. do one of the books, that would generate a little more interest than um, than just me doing it. I'm very excited I'm, about the idea of you doing Big Thunder and Rumors of the Marvel still, because after spending a long nighter yesterday drinking coffee at yeah what midnight. is wrong with you <laughs> yeah what was the noticed? deal with that? this guy it was of i know right before, healthy, i was so in good company it. man i was in good company you and yeah. glenn man you guys were entertaining well, me yeah. i was i'm delighted we were there but for christ's sake man you can't yeah. drink caffeine after six well, o'clock i night. can't go out to a pub this friday night can i it's yeah. like True. i'm True. in freaking covid land we're here. gonna have to keep <laughs> checking oh, on you to make sure you're still alive yeah. Sure. Yeah. I know you you look good. You know, obviously <laughs> yeah. you can you, you can cope. Um <laughs> like he's level young. So, County. Oh yeah. So he's no, old. thank you. Um, um I'm looking forward to completing yeah. the readings of them too. Um but we did, but Doug did Morning Start in I'm sure he won't in his studio, mm. which as he describes it to me, is a closet which he has soundproofed. Okay. Um, it's in, you know, it's in the house in Pittsburgh. Um, so Came he, out great. Came out great. Yeah, right, no, exactly. And uh, so he did that there. And, and the, well, I mean, I can, don't, 
I don't want to disappoint people if this doesn't happen. But annoyingly, the other th my other brilliant marketing coup was um, I got Doug to do Morningstar and I'm going to get Ashley to do Moontown. Oh, and, oh, and Ashley hey. wants to do it and is right on what board. A scoop. A scoop and then <laughs> and then pandemic. Because she doesn't have a studio, so she was going to come. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to drive her down to Mark's Place in Long Beach for the sessions. And so, again, you know, that hasn't happened either. But That is so cool. So, so all those happen. Ashley fans out there, don't hold it against me. If, it, if this goes on like it's going on, it'll be a year before we can even get her in the, in the studio. But... Um, but yeah, I thought that would be great. I thought if we were going to do audio books, I could get great idea. My yeah. my beautiful old friends and colleagues, Ashley, yeah. Kirsty, and Pinhead. Let's be great honest; idea. it's a purely great. mercantile move. Well, I figured if it's I can awesome. Get bring and bring all those Hellraiser fans over. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, that, awesome. That, awesome. That is kind of what I've I was got, thinking. I've got Moon Town right here, keeping me <laughs> company. Uh, it's an ex library book from I think. Washoe County Library it says no longer property of Washoe County Library. It's also signed. All right. Copy Look number that. But now what, color, what color ink is that? This, let me see. It's I think it's regular. <laughs> Might be it's purple. a dark blue. Yeah. Dark. Okay. yeah. So uh, libraries, yes. if, you, if you see Jose coming, lock the doors. Yeah. <laughs> right. And um, since it's an ex-library no, book, it's, it smells you... wonderfully of mothballs. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um. Do you have a very civilized library that doesn't put permanent bro darts on them, or are you particularly good at getting bro darts off? Do you know what I mean by bro darts? The <laughs> What's um, a bro dart? The 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 see through cellophane cover. All that crap they put all over books. Oh yeah, I, I, oh. I buy those. I put them on my books. No, me, me too. Yes, the, the, yeah. the, but libraries at least. When I, yeah, I guess they don't do this anymore. They used to put a bro dart on, but then they'd sew the bro dart Ooh. sealed. Right. So, yeah, right. so yeah. I've got a lot of ex library books. This that one I, I know what like. you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah this yeah. one isn't. It's an Earthling uh, release, and yeah. it doesn't have the cellophane. And uh, I have a, a handful of books that have that. But unfortunately, I haven't really been that disciplined in keeping my books like that. I, I'm just a big handler of books, and I just. Me too. I just have them all oh, over. I, the I, I, I love putting I, those on there, and I and I and yeah. you tape them to they tape to themselves so that you don't have to you don't have to yeah. mess up the covers. No, it, yeah. Ryan, you're right. Jose and I are wrong. <laughs> it, that is, it's the better <laughs> thing to do. But but I'm like you. I uh, I mean to, and I've you know some of the more collectible things I've got, I've got bro in. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think this yeah. Whole, but yeah, I this just whole say, shelf right here is all they all have that on there. It's good. It's good. That's <laughs> as Mister Punch would say. That's the way to do it. Um, <laughs> that is the way to do it. But um, I just it's so saying? it just makes yeah, me so, so sad so when you pull it, the book off the shelf and it's rubbed some of the color off of the da dust jacket. Oh, uh, cruel work of time. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> another, um, also living in L.A., which is you know technically a desert means that um your books don't get moldy which is good you know in england you can you've got to keep checking them that you don't get mold because england's a damp country mm. here you get this weird sort of drying out can happen mm -hmm. to um particularly the casings of hardcover books can they get start a little curling yeah, yeah uh, right right yeah. so so it's a sad reminder every day that these things will be eaten by time yeah. it's so I, I have depressing. I have full faith that we'll be able to listen to in the future to Moon Town by Ashley Lawrence whenever we that happens, so. and you know this wonderful Rumors of the Marvelous. Which is this a compilation of stories that you uh, wrote for the Rolling Darkness review? Um, most of the ones in that book are from the review. Not not all of them. Um, right. Right. Uh, I mean, it doesn't. Stacy and her idiot was written for Dark Delicacies anthology. Um, King about a space was written for an anthology. Dennis edited, but yeah, I think at least eight or nine of the stories. Look at that handsome fellow. That, <laughs> by the way, the painting is by the great Les Edwards. Oh right? yeah, right. Um, do you, uh, yeah, he, I mean, he's done. 
He did the well, Nightmare. One of the US yeah. covers, but did comic he's, books, yeah. you know, one of the biggest UK cover artists. And again, a great guy. Well, and, um, and speaking so, of story compilations, Rob Reidenauer said, uh, good to hear Pete's coming back to the show. The question I have is, how is his upcoming new short story co- collection coming along? And you've mentioned it a few times in the past. He says, I was curious if there were any new updates. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, put it this way. There are more stories in it than there were last time Rob asked. <laughs> All but right. I'm, I am so yeah. slow. Um I think, and we we should preface this um, by saying that Rob, you know Rob, and he he put us together with you the last time that, that sure, you, yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's um, a good guy, and we miss he's him. He's a great guy, and yes, I'm giving him a wave. All right, and uh, and I hope next time you know he'll be he'll be on board with us when uh, yeah. when we do yeah it again. yeah. Um, but but in answer to his question, um, I do have, I'm so slow, but I have. I can't remember. I think I've got 10 stories that haven't been collected so that could form the next collection. Um, but that only adds up to about 40,000 words. And like, it's, it's just, just at the point where you could cheat it. Like you could make it look like a real book by being very generous with the margins, <laughs> putting, you know, making sure each story ends on this page. So you have a blank page there and a title <laughs> page for a new song. Oh, so you, come on. 40,000 words is, is just enough to cheat a book, <clears throat> but really borderline. Um, now, collections don't have to be novel length. They don't have to be it's, like 80. It's not about the quantity. It's the quality, right? God bless you, sir. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. But it has to meet a certain a certain minimum threshold of so many jokes, a certain Mm. minimum threshold of length is required. (laughs) If you know what I mean. Um, But um, so I I would say, I would say two more stories and it would be sufficient to be unembarrassedly released as a book. Mm. It would feel like a book. People would say he's not ripping us off. This is, you know, 200 pages, 50,000 words, whatever. So so it's getting there, Rob, and thank you for your interest. All right. Um, so, yeah, t- two more stories. So, you know, maybe three years from now. I don't know. We'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll see. Um, I think – I think we're going to get into some of these questions uh, from the fans now, if that's sure. okay with everybody. Uh, this one I think would be a good segue – Ralph Miller uh, said, I'm happy to see that Peter Atkins will be on the Barker cast soon. Would you consider asking him some questions for me? So one of the topics that he proposed, and he wrote a long paragraph, but I'm, I'm yeah. going to bring this one up. Could you describe how your writing process differs when you're writing original material such as Wishmaster as opposed to your Hellraiser franchise work? Hmm. If that, if that helps, he follows up with, does the freedom of original work make it more challenging to begin the work and arrive at the story structure? Huh. Um, first of all, I'm uh, very flattered that he calls Wishmaster original um, because, you know, God knows there have been genie stories before. Um, but kidding aside, you know, I... For such a smarty pants, I really do work by instinct rather than intellectual schematics. Um, so I'm I'm certainly not avoiding. And is, is it Ralph? Did you say Ralph Miller? Ralph yeah, Miller. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. Um, so Ralph, not avoiding the question at all. But it's sort of I don't feel the difference too much. <coughs> the I mean, listen. Of course, Clive created a universe. So, you know, like being brought on to write an episode of a TV show or to write a a short story set in a shared world universe, there are certain givens which obviously help, you know. And um, so the fact that I knew I had Kirsty and Pinhead and Julia to play with uh, when I entered the Hellraiser universe definitely helped um but it doesn't really help in terms of i think the phrase you used was story structure you've still got to plan out um or in my case not plan (laughs) fly fly by the seat of your pants out um 
what's go what is going to happen to these people how and when it's going to happen how they're going to react so in some ways the 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 creative challenges of the execution of a piece as opposed to an idea um really doesn't differ that much you know but um but yeah as, in terms of a starting point if, if you're in an existing like if somebody said you want to write a star trek movie you've got a set of givens mm -hmm. um that are obviously going to help um it's I'm also sure, probably, in fact, if, if somebody go ahead oh it's i was gonna it's probably also got to help having a you know a longtime friend you know being the the originator of the Oh, of sure. the series yeah. and having a uh, having an easygoing, good working relationship with with Clive. Uh, uh, of course, hundred percent. Yes, um, and it's unavoidable to get into sometimes genre tropes here and there. Um, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, but um, but yeah, I think in terms of Ralph's question, the um, well, let me let me simplify that. And I realize Ralph wasn't being as simple as this. I'm, I'm sort of trying to do a reductio ad absurdum uh, to try and make it clear. It's um, that thing where, you know, somebody can say, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you write it and we'll split the money, mm -hmm. which every, <laughs> every writer makes jokes about because it's like, sweetheart, ideas aren't the problem. Right. right in the fucking thing is the problem. <laughs> right. and, so, and, and if I can so just when, interrupt, you know, uh, sometimes way, people some do of these... actually say that. Yeah. And and so my, my response now always is, oh, that's interesting because I've got ideas too. Why don't you write them and we'll split the money? <laughs> um, right. If I can just say something, uh, sometimes people don't know exactly how certain movies are made. For example, sure. uh, there are treatments which are not scripts. They're just... Uh, four or five six page treatments that say how about we do like a movie with like this monster and it's going to be this and that and this main character right things happen and this is how it's going to end and then they have to hire in the screenwriter who comes in and says okay well let me see what i can do with this and and that right. yeah so sometimes it's not just i have a vision and i'm going to write it down i'm going to write this screenplay and it's sure sometimes it, sure. it comes with you know, other people bringing in certain ideas or notes or, yeah. So oh, uh, oh yes, and it and once you've written the script, those notes don't stop. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's, literally there's until input. the photography there's, is is undergoing. There's people like bring. Oh, here's a revised yeah. line yeah. for you, right? Brett, right. Bug, there's you creative know. input all the way down the line. And and, uh, and and Ralph had asked if Hellraiser film scripts entailed more rewrites than Wishmaster. Um, no, probably about the same. Um, I mean, I mean, at least in my experience, obviously I, I can't speak for the Hellraiser movies that came after me. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually don't know how many drafts Clive wrote of the first one. Um, but in my experience, both, both with the Hellraiser movies I wrote with Wishmaster and with various other, because yeah, I, I mean, I made my living as a screenwriter for 20 years, even though, and this is a sad truth about screenwriting, and one of the reasons so many of us try to keep our hand in in prose fiction as well is you can make a living and be paid to do scripts that never get produced. Yeah. So, um, so I've I've actually written dozens. I, I, well, yeah, literally dozens. Yeah, I, I think twenty six I wrote over the course of a. 15 to 18 year mm -hmm. career as, as a writer and you know the only produced ones were the three a Hellraisers, handful. Wishmaster, Fist of the North Star, this piece of shit yeah. Prisoners of the Sun that finally came out <laughs> five or six years ago, a couple of teleplays, the perversions of science so you know actually less than 50% of the scripts I was paid to write mm -hmm. were produced Hey, Pete. Which is which is neither here nor there, but what, what I mean is, I have a fairly good idea of what the normal process is, mm -hmm. um, right. and I would say there are some nightmare projects. I've never, thank God, I never went through one of these twenty-one draft scenarios. Oh God, yeah. But you do hear about them, and for some years, you know, because one likes to give back. I was, uh, I worked. <coughs> 
the Writers Guild are the only people who who can determine writers' credits in Hollywood. That was that was a hard won right that our union got back in the forties, I think. Um, because it used to be that the producers would just decide who got screenplay credit, and right. it might be their girlfriend, you know. Mm. And now there are percentages or, or of the the work of an author that had to be in there in order for them to get their yeah, name in the right. credits, right? right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, but now only the Writers Guild determines only writers determine writers' credits, and um, and you don't get paid for it, but produce screenwriters volunteer their time to be on what's called the screen credits committee mm -hmm. so uh and <laughs> i was either good enough or charming enough to get promoted onto the committee itself so i didn't have to read all the fucking drafts <laughs> i would just handle <laughs> the uh the meetings with the writers and try and you know come to a happy solution for everybody right. but right. but you begin at, as a volunteer reading these drafts and and venturing an opinion um about well you know right and it's anonymous so you don't you know so you can't do your friend out of a credit it's like mm -hmm. oh dave scow wrote this fuck that <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah i don't know who they are right. um but there are increasingly um before lockdown again you would the studio the big studio pictures were getting ridiculous you were getting like 22 drafts of a screenplay Whoa, from seven different writers. And it's, it's just absurd. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, the sorry. The, the another producers... sidebar. I, that never happened to me. My experience, I would say the average is five. I think okay. you, you do a first draft, you get some notes. Usually they're fairly mild after the first draft. You do, you do a second draft. Yeah. Around then they start looking for a director uh like you know tony randall came on just before i wrote the third draft of hellbound mm. for example um i think and kevin came on i might actually have done four drafts of bloodline before they found a director oh, wow. um so you know so you you do those and then obviously you know you then hopefully bond with the director and have a friendly chat with him or her mm. and then you'll do another draft to incorporate some of their stupid ideas. Just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. and, then, and then there will be, if you're lucky enough to go into production, there will be, at that stage, you're not really doing another draft. What you're doing is... Um, A polish. Well, no, uh, you'll do changes, but they bring them in. I don't know if this still goes on now, um, but it just used to be, it was color-coded. Mm -hmm. So that, like, they would suddenly realize, oh, shit, you know, Ashley's got to be in Kansas to shoot another movie. Mm -hmm. So we've only got two days for this sequence. Can you make the scene shorter? In other words, usually at that point, it's, it's pragmatic things oh, like, okay. oh, the building we thought we had the rights to film in. They've just tripled their asking price. Right. set the scene somewhere else. So you do little fixes and they issue the cast and crew with colored pages. And you can usually tell, again, this is all very inside baseball. I'm sorry if it's boring, but um, you Not can usually all. tell how much trouble a production is in by the rainbow the of various the colors. <laughs> yeah, by the t and seriously, and they're always in sequence. So, you know, oh, wow. pink pages are a first production pass. Blue pages are a second. Yell. Anyway, Everybody knows that if you get to Goldenrod, the movie's you've gone too far. <laughs> yeah, right. it's right. like you're, that means you are you've done eight passes during oh, production, oh. which is not a good sign. Wow. So Pete. let me tell you, Bloodline went way through Goldenrod and back to blue on a second set of paint. Oh no! Because yeah. oh, no. that thing, that oh. thing was fucked. Pete. Let me follow up since you're talking about Bloodline right there with a real sure. quick. We had another question from somebody who wanted to know, how did you come up with the idea for um, Wishmaster? Well, it, interestingly, I'll tell you exactly how I came up with the idea. For I think that was Jeff from uh, Decades of Horror asked that. Oh, OK. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for the question. Um, and I can answer it precisely. Yeah. My phone rang and I picked it up. 
And it was a friend of mine called Eric Salzgeber, who some of you might know from the Hellraiser comic books. Yeah. He, he wrote several uh-huh. stories for, but he had been an executive mm-hmm. at New World back when I was writing Hellbound and the first version of Hellraiser 3. And he and I had stayed friendly. He'd moved on and was now working for Pierre David's company. Uh, Pierre David was a, a French Canadian producer who, I guess, most famously had produced a couple of early Cronenberg pictures. Oh, okay. um, and Eric is now working for him. So anyway, so the phone rings, and it's and Eric and I are friends. You know, we, there's, there's nothing odd about him phoning me. He could well have been calling to say, oh do you want to come to the baseball game on Saturday? Oh um, but he called and said, hey, do you want to write an evil genie movie for Pierre David? And I said, fuck off. That's the worst <laughs> idea I've ever heard in my life. Evil <laughs> genie movie. <laughs> Eric, seriously, man, I am not going to come in and pitch an evil genie movie. And then Eric said, shut up. You don't have to pitch. If you want the job, if you want the paying gig, it's yours. And suddenly, oh, <laughs> the idea of an evil genie was the greatest idea I'd ever heard. Uh huh. <laughs> so I said, yeah, you bet. I'll be in with a take on Monday. So. Nice. So, Jeff, I, I don't mean to be flippant about your question. I'm sorry. That is, that the, is way, the literal Pete, truth Pete, of uh, of Pete, how that starts. Ed, yes. Ed is trying to ask. Yeah. Pete, my, my friend Guy Conrad actually asked that question. I'm sorry. Nina corrected me. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. Did you say Dyke? G- no, guy, guy. Guy Conrad. Uh, yeah. I thought that was a callback to the Dyke siren joke from earlier. <laughs> and the police cards. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Guy, well, hi Jeff. Anyway, and hi Guy. Thank you for your question. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not being flippant. That actually is what happened. I didn't think it was a great idea, um, but they were going to pay me, you know. So I thought, well, I'm sure I can do something with it. Um, so the process then, Guy, was was to all intents and purposes, it was an original script in the sense that that's all they had. It wasn't like I was coming in on Hellraiser to write a sequel in an existing universe. Yeah. They just wanted an evil genie movie. It's, so, it's so, just such a it's such a great movie, you know. It's uh, oh, Kurtzman directed it, right? Uh, Robert Kurtzman, yeah, it was the K and B. Yeah, and you got right. Angus Scrim, you know, the tall man narrating it, and uh, you know. oh, that was all. Bo- yes, I. I it's a, there's a lot of sort of, again, in-house fun going on in that movie. I pepper the script with all kinds. Of, all the character names are horror authors. The place names are horror-related. Yeah. But and all the, the icons Bob of horror is the are guy. in it, too. Robert England's in it. Tony Todd's yeah, in it. That, you know, yeah. Tons exactly. Of- yeah, that, that's what I'm saying, Ed. That was all down to Bob because, of course, uh, again, for people who don't know, though I know most of your viewers do know, um, Robert Kurtzman, Bob, is was the K in KNB, which is like one of the oh, great okay. physical effects houses. So yeah, he still has an effects company. He just yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. But States. he doesn't work with Greg and uh, Ed anymore, um, Howard anymore. Um, I, I, they're still friends. Not right. I'm not trying to suggest yeah. any fallout here. Right. No, no, no. But, no. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it was Kurtzman, Nicotero, and Berger was was KNB. And yeah, and their master and Greg, of course, is now world famous as Directing. the Walking Dead yeah. guy. Um, and so uh, I don't hear from him anymore. And to, to, uh, <laughs> to follow and up Andrew, on that, Andrew uh, Divoff was such a charismatic actor for the the genie, right? I mean, Divoff. Oh, yeah, no, he, unfortunately, he, he they were right, placed. He was him. so lucky. Oh, yeah. yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah, uh, I, I think I saw the third or fourth the other day on TV, and I, I thought, oh my god, this this is horrible. Ready. Right. Yeah, Pete, what's the story on two and three? Because somebody else asked about that. You know, yeah, like, Raul, Raul from uh, Discord asked, uh, my question regarding the film are, uh, why didn't he write the sequel to Wishmaster? As far as I know, Jack Shoulder did it himself. And what memories do you have from adapting Fist of the North Star? So I guess we'll start with the Wishmaster 2 question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will definitely address that. Let, let me just put a button on, on what I was saying, which was mm. that... Um, I filled it full of references and fun and wanted it to be very uh, in-house for, for true horror fans. Bob, because he was the K and K and B, had everybody's phone number. He had put oh. makeup on all of those people. And they loved him. You know, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, so 
the reason it's like a who's who of 80s horror is Bob's Rolodex. Uh, footnotes for people under the age of 50. A Rolodex was this <laughs> physical object <laughs> that used to contain... Maybe under um, the age of 30, I think. is. Yeah, right. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but it, yeah, he got all those people. Um, and it, it is, it's like, oh, except, but I got Tony Todd. Um, oh. Because he had been, well, I, look, I don't want to, Bob got everybody. Bob, all those names, Robert Englund, Angus Scrim, Reggie, uh, Ted Ramey, I am already forget who uh, Kane, Kane is in it. Who else? Do, uh, all those people. Oh, and, and, and yeah, Reggie but Tony, Tony and George to... Flower, who always plays oh, like a Bob homeless Flower. guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He always <laughs> plays like the <laughs> homeless guy, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, he died. And even think, Gary Tunnicliffe even worked on the effects on that. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, a lot of people. What was it? <laughs> oh, for some reason, they were having trouble persuading Tony to do the movie. And so Shannon Golding, who was an executive at Live, Pierre's company was the production company that made the movie. The money was from Live, who became Artisan a few years later, after they made a fortune from Blair Witch. Um, but so Shannon Golding called me and said, will you do a conference call with Tony Todd and me and talk him into doing this movie? And I said, I never met Tony. Obviously, Tony had done Candyman, and Shannon was assuming, well, you must all go to the same parties. Yeah, you must know <laughs> uh, him, right? Right. <laughs> but I'd never met Tony. Mm. But... Um, Anyway, I, I managed to persuade him over the course right. of a phone call, which was and he was great. It's great to have him in the movie. Um, yes. So, but that was all prior to Raoul's question about, about two. Oh, two and three. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, they didn't ask me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, we did. Uh, we'd done the movie, and it you know performed pretty well for them. It was um, until Blair Witch. It was certainly their biggest hit. Um, but I I don't know if they had I don't know why they didn't want me and Bob to do it because both Bob and I were ready to do a sequel. Yeah, we we didn't get as far as planning it or anything, but we were ready to do it. I don't know why they didn't call us. Yeah. I am told, though I was not in the room, that um Jack Shoulder pitched himself for the writing and directing gig by explaining to the live executives the reason Wishmaster was shit oh. and how he could make what? it better in number two. Now, so routinely, when I've told this story over the years, I've always ended it with, fuck you, Jack. But but I realized I don't know that that's true. Mm. I was told it by a fairly reliable source, yeah. but... Well, but I don't know. Sure. To, to um, me, Wishmaster One is the, is memorable and and good, and I don't really remember the other ones. So, there God go. bless you, Ryan. That, <laughs> yeah. That's the stuff. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Andrew's in number two, so you know, so I I I, I want number two to be good and do well mm. for, for him. Andrew. <laughs> um, Andrew's not in three and four, so. I didn't really. There is a four. I didn't even know there was a four. Yeah. Oh, there was <laughs> yeah, a four. Yeah. They, I, as far as I know, they filmed three and four back to back. Oh. Uh -huh. um, I, I think it, I saw back four back at the same time. You know. It was, yeah. It was, it was hideous. It, it's Who did some they get to guy with a, a cheap mask. Some some, uh, some it, nobody man. That's like oh, it's really bad. Well, it's like. It, is it like crazy? Wasn't it Sean Connery's song, or am I making that up? I, I can look it up. I can look it up if you want me to. Does the makeup stay the same? Does but if the show like, no. Jason, the makeup was, is very simplified. Ed. The makeup oh. is very much simplified oh. to the point where most times the genie is just the guy. Oh, so I, the yeah, I, yeah. I uh, don't think they oh, had the see. money. I, I don't think yeah. they were budgeted. Um, did you did you write in the script any description of him? Like, does that design was that just come up with by the effects guys? No, that's that's. I, I mean. Of course, you, you, you describe the monster when you write it, but um, that gin makeup, I the, mean, the makeup is, is based on, say again, you know, the tendrils on his head, you know, like horns. 
I think I said I might have used the phrase horn like protuberances. I'm okay, not sure yeah, if I said like tendrils. Horns or um, there you go. Horns. I, I, as with the Cenobites that I invented for the sequels, um, I'm happy to venture a description on the page in the full and certain knowledge that Bob Keane or Jeff Portas or Gary Tonicliffe or Bob Kurtzman is just going to come up with a better picture. Um, <laughs> so so the, the, the finished look, the, the, the great makeup on Andrew in The First Wishmaster, it probably bears some relation to what I wrote in this. I mean, the script's published, so, you oh, know, okay. you can look it up. It, it probably says, you know, a vaguely demonic appearance. I, I don't know. Because you, cause, because you know that some genius, some special effects is genius come up is with going the to design, do yeah. the look. And um, so that was that was Bob's sketch mm. uh, became cool. the maker. Cool. I never yeah. knew that. And the thing about um, Fist of the Nossa, you know, well, first of all, it was, I was reunited with Tony Randall. I say reunited. We're very close friends to this day. We see each other and talk to each other all the time. But it was the second time we got to make a movie together. Um, so I have very fond memories of that. The big thing for me, and we, funnily enough, we've mentioned him in passing, is uh, I got to meet little Alex from Clockwork Orange. Malcolm McDowell is in oh, cool. Mr. Yeah. the North Star. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, Nick Vince just did a podcast with him. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, I yeah, because that. Malcolm is now doing that circuit, I think. You know, the, the, yeah, the convention yeah. circuit the convention that Doug and right. Ashley... Right. I think they're all represented by the same person called Rich... Uh, uh, Chris, oh, Chris Rowe. Rowe. Yes, Chris Rowe, yeah. So yeah. I think the podcast, The Chattering Hour, is coming out under the Chris Rowe Management YouTube channel yes. and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen Nick's logo for it. It looks good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I listened to that one. It was very entertaining. It was, it was good, yeah. Oh, I'm 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 sure. I'm sure yeah, well Nick's good at getting stories out of people anyway. He's interesting himself. And I'm sure Malcolm has got a zillion stories. Mm, yeah. Um uh but yeah, it was a thrill for me. Um first of all, it turned out he's from Liverpool, which I didn't know, because um I assumed he was a northern lad, but not that this means as much to him. His accent in Clockwork Orange is vaguely Mancunian, M Manchester rather than mm. Liverpool. But it turns out that uh, Malcolm was from Walton, which is uh, a district in Liverpool. So I met him on set. He was great. And it was just, it, we only had him for two days. But um, I had Malcolm McDowell speaking lines I wrote. So it was like, <laughs> that's cool. fantastic. Yeah. It's like, Jesus Christ, that's Alex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a and hard, right? It's I mean, a hard, uh, uh, it's a hard anime to adapt because it's just so over the oh, top. Yeah. Yeah. How much did yeah, you we know should have done it? Japanese I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, I have those are the fond memories I have of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> should the movie exist? No. No. It should not. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'll say this, Tony had a tiny budget, Tony Randall had a tiny budget, and he made it look great. Um, uh, Clark it's Hunter hard. was production designer who worked miracles. It looks like a bigger movie than it is, um, mm -hmm. thanks to Tony and Clark. And and I, God, I might have, I think Jacques Haitkin shot it, was the DP. Um I might be mixing some of Tony's movies up. Jacques certainly worked with uh, with Tony, um, but it's hard to find to... good things to say about it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's um, Malcolm's great, uh, of course, yeah, and you know, Clint Howard's in it, Chris Penn is in it. You know, there's moving there's, on. There's some <laughs> elements, but yeah, yeah, moving on. So okay. to quote the Blue Valentine in The Return of Boy Justice, let us explore the labyrinth. Ah, nice. <laughs> ah. See what he did yeah. there? <laughs> that story made me cry like a butthole, man. Oh. Yeah. You know, I, I meant to thank you for that. You, you'd said that on the voicemail you left. And and I, I know I called you back when we talked about the other things, just pragmatic things. But I meant to say thank you very much for uh, for saying that. That's great because that was the aim of that story. To, to wring a tear from uh, 
to, well, to, to, uh, I wanted to make sure it had a mix of melancholy poetics and unflinching violence. Is that what John said? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. With the uh, KGB and uh, the other guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Irish. Yeah, I, I, yes. It's not a. It's not a particularly violent story. Yeah. But, uh, oh, it was awesome. Just yeah, the right yeah. mixture. Just the right mixture. Oh well, th thank you. Ed. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's let's get some of these questions that the fans have put sure. in. Um. Okay. Mm, let's see. Start with Hellraiser three, probably. And <clears throat> sure. Let's see. What's the question that's about Hellraiser 3? Do you know the name of the person who asked that? Let's see. Nina, do you have a... Um, There's a ton of questions. It better not be Danny Stewart. He's got a book full of memories. From yeah, yeah. Day. We can, do, oh we can start with, with his if you want. Uh, he says, oh. your memories of Hellraiser 3 with to uh, Tony Hickox being a Cenobite, your favorite scenes, and metaphorical and subtextual elements of hell on earth being war is hell. Let's well, start with your. I think I think one just says <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, it is kind of a yes or no question. Tell us about well, the. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, tell clearly, the war is hell is is the subtext of uh, of the movie. Hence, the World War One footage and the Vietnam footage, and the Joey's lost father and Elliot being part of the Lost Generation, all that stuff. Um, but tell us about being a Cenobite. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, let, let's get on to the stuff people are actually interested in. <laughs> um, well, it was great. I mean, uh, you know. How did it happen? Like, in other words, you were not going to be a Cenobite originally, right? You No, of course not. No, no. Yeah. It, um, was and, it and again, CD and Barbie that were uh, created at a later stage? Yes. Yeah, they were certainly, yeah. certainly not in the first or second draft. Um, obviously, again, I, I, I assume we're talking to hardcore fans. Yes. So I can People shorthand heard this. Most of your obviously, JP stuff. and Terry were destined to become Ursat uh, Cenobites. But um, Doc, the bartender, and the DJ becoming um, camera head. CD head and Barbie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that that arrived later. And, I had heard uh, that Gary Tunnicliffe said that CD head. I, I mean, not CD head, but uh, camera head had been pre production planned because that was such an elaborate. Oh, they were all pre production. Yeah, oh yeah, no, no, no. By the time we were shooting it, there's a again. I, I don't want to get too too inside baseball, but as Jose mentioned earlier. People have the, have sort of lovely visions of how movies are actually made, and they have certain assumptions and certain beliefs. One of the things, one false impression, perhaps, that people have is they hear screenwriters bitch so much about, they really messed with my script, man. They changed it. They changed it. It's very rare that those changes happen during production because – it's a business, you know, and it's it's a it's a factory. There's a lot of people. There's 200 people, cast and crew. Um, well, depending on your budget, between 100 and 200 people, cast and crew. It so takes a village. It it and how? Yeah, and and like and it's got to be a village that uh, it's a village with a set budget. So it's got to run on time. The trains have got to run on time, and people have got to be fed. You know, it's it's a very pragmatic and hard headed operation the actual production of a movie now obviously um the director and the actors are going to practice art within the confines of that tight shape but it's ex it's not that it hasn't happened but it's extremely rare that oh wait a minute you know let's rethink this entire scene everybody take three hours you don't send union guys off for a three hour break. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, mm -hmm. you got to meet your schedule, meet your budget. So when screenwriters bitch about it, what, what they mean is that during the development process prior to production, um, they mess with your script, they change things uh, or, the, or they didn't, you know, cause screenwriters are a whiny self-important bunch just in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> 
And it always makes me laugh when screenwriters regularly refer to executives as assholes. And I always think, yeah, so are we. You know, it's <laughs> like, geez. I mean, they're right. Executives are assholes. But um, but when did Camerahead come in? Was he, like, in other words, Gary Tunnicliffe has said in interviews before that I think that that was being worked on back in England at Bob Keane's shop and that the mm-hmm. camera head, you know, design was earlier in pre-production. And so when oh, did you change? All, all of them, all of them, Ed. Um, yeah, like I say, none of those changes were production changes because you, you don't do it. It's like, especially... If so you the stories to, about you, CD head and your Cenobite getting created on location in America versus being created in England in Bob Keane's shop. When you say create, oh, you you mean the the physical build, the the mask, right, and, right. Like in other words, I know that supposedly the head that you wore was a victim's head. It was a guy who got killed by barbed wire in the boiler room. Oh, and really? They turned, and they well, yes, that the barman. Into your mask. It's actually on camera. You see the yeah. um, reverse shot of the yeah. The barbed you see the reverse wire. of the barbed wire wrapped around my face. Yeah, and next time you see me. I'm as heavy as I am in real life now, and I've lost all my hair. See how life imitates art? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's – that's so it was a victim in the sense that it was it was the bartender became Barbie, the, yeah. the Cenobite. But um, <clears throat> I, Ed, I, I don't know where the molds for the masks were made, whether it was – But what I mean is, was that molded on a, a life cast of your head, or was that on – Oh, God, no. Yeah, no, 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 no. CD head and Barbie were, were put. I mean, obviously, it's not like here's a mask, put it on. You are in the makeup chair mm-hmm. and they have to do the fine tunings and fix your eyes, and all this stuff. But it's not like um, they did not mold your up. head in advance and then no, for you. no, 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 no. They were um, uh, Ken Carpenter, who played Doc, who became camera head. That was an in the chair job, not as elaborate a job sure. as Pinhead, but that was an in in the chair job. And his um, head was molded the others were not. But what I'm saying, Ed, is it yeah. wasn't like we made them up on the hop. That's what I'm saying. As, as you know, you know, you worked in in the industry. That very rarely happens. Mm-hmm. Actors can well, improvise lines, you know, the, the and directors also, can say those costumes were made from local suppliers like they went to the pet store gary tunnicliffe says and bought dog collars and chains and stuff to put on the two sure. set bites yeah, that but, were not oh, designed okay. to either, you know? <laughs> like they went to hot topic or someplace and went to <laughs> you know, got crap uh, they just threw together you know on um the, I, just, just the story. So I don't know i know for our listeners who want to know more about all this stuff about gary tunnicliffe i think this is an interview that he he, he talked to a channel called the Midnight's Edge. Is that right, Ed? Yes. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. So he's obviously the guy who knows more about this, but yeah. Well, he didn't even go to America. He was in England working on these things. Oh, yeah. So- Gar- Gary wasn't on the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds dismissive. Gary's part of the Hellraiser family, but yeah, he was not in North Carolina right. on the shoot. He only um, came to America for the reshoot in England. For the reshoot LA. in LA. Yes, yeah. correct. And I was there for that, you know. Yeah. Um, but in terms of uh, – here's what I know. Bob's shop had been set up in North Carolina at least a week or two before I got there, and that was still three weeks before production. I was there for the three weeks prior to production. Um, Bob had already been there. So, uh, you know, yeah, because they had to which pieces the had been pillar. pre-made at Pinewood? And flown out with Bob and Steve and Mark and everybody. Uh, I don't know, and and which had been, but the, you know, it was a full scale production village, and Bob had his shop there. So either they made the costumes and the masks in High Point, North Carolina, or maybe they flew some out from London. Um, but the but the answer to the when were they invented? question is In yeah of course lo- long before production they, they weren't made up on you know on the day okay um gotcha and there was i'm sorry there was another element to that question there was a specific 
Just uh-huh. the fact that, like, in other words, if you had not, you know, been molded and cast and stuff so that, in other words, what Gary basically said was that those faces, your mask face and the CD face, were going to be just dead guys in the boiler room, you know, that were part of the carnage. And that Probably. once they got to America, they decided to add more Cenobites. No, no. That's all I all I know is Pete Atkins is in the movie and you're spitting fire. So the, that, yeah, that's and, what and that counts. is not you. Thank of you for getting down to the important <laughs> topic. Like, he, here's what I'll say. I'm sure Gary knows precisely what he's talking about. And I, I'm sure they were working on certain things in London and th- some materials and some pre made will have come out with Bob. Um, but and they may well have repurposed existing head bits sure. which right. they do all the right. time you know um but well, yeah no there's the, the, no yeah they were always they were always going to be there they were but, but it was you going through the wall of bricks right and that's you in the costume. yes yeah <laughs> um, awesome. yeah it, it but was, that was so not of course you when they weren't fire, really bricks, right that's a you know. dummy that's a yeah that's a course. that's a prop right yeah when the, the, the fire comes out of the mouth of mouth it depends which shot you're looking at. Ah. Um, yes, when when the flame comes out of the mouth to camera, that's a. It wasn't even a full dummy. It was it was a head bust on a ah. stand. Um, but there's also a shot where it's a profile shot and the fire comes out, and that was um, see the mouth open. Yeah, uh, the fire was. The local pyro guy who uh, just loved fire. <laughs> it's like <laughs> he was he was a man who was happy in his profession. Yeah. Um, so he rigged up this thing where it was just like a little flamethrower. And, be, you know, because of forced perspective of mm-hmm. what well, not forced perspective at all. Just the, camera in other words, the fire here. was behind you and you the fire was to the side right. of me. Ah. The camera was here. So the, the flamethrower bursts forth and on cue because i'm a professional i open my mouth and it looks as like the flame goes <laughs> and from here where the camera is looking it looks like the flame is coming awesome. out of my mouth and um that was the only moment i was anywhere near fire, the fire. <laughs> and it's still 18 inches away but sure. um as I said, the guy loved his fire, the yeah. local guy, and yeah. he was rigging me up. And I said, um, "Listen, how big is the flame going to be? Because I, I just want to be right. I don't want to flinch, you know. So, uh, how big is it going to be?" And he said, "It's going to be huge." <laughs> 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 and uh, and then so I, you know, forewarned his forearms, so I was calm, and, I, and it was huge. But I didn't flinch because he knew what he was doing. The guy was a pro. Mm-hmm. Um, but it happened. And I think we did two takes of safety. And then he came back and started dismantling. And he said very courteously, you know, was that OK? You know, was it good? And I said, uh, yeah, it uh, kind of felt good. <laughs> and, he, and he leaned in and said, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I felt like I was being initiated into some That's little cool. inside cult. Worth so smoking. So yeah, I don't think like, you've ever talked about this anywhere else. You know, I, um, I I don't know. The problem is, as I, as I always do, I apologize because you know it's thirty years. So you get asked these questions, you forget what you've told and what you haven't told. <laughs> Um, well, we're pretty knowledgeable about what you've been on camera and saying and b- documentaries and behind the scenes of things. Sure. And I don't yeah. think I've ever heard you talk about this particular stuff before, you know. Maybe not. I thought I thought I'd talked about it in not certainly not on camera, but Paul Kane's second ah. book. Oh, no, no no a legacy yeah. book. Yeah. But, <clears throat> did a physical book ever come out for that, by the way? It didn't, right? It's still just I, an ebook. Or, yeah, I, I just have the ebook version. I don't think right, it has yeah. come out yet. No, I need to ask Paul about that. Sure, yeah. sure. That would but be anyways, great if it ever comes out. Thank you for talking about Hellraiser yeah. three like that. That I believe that would wrap up Danny's questions, and now we yeah. could move on. Okay, to sure. And and uh, well, 
Jeff Moore asked about Hellbound. He said, uh, what effect did budget cuts uh, have on Hellbound and like what kind of compromises did you have to make? Wow. Uh, well, that, that easy. that's a vast question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was it Black Monday that yeah, uh, destroyed right, a third right. of the budget, I think? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for, for people, again, under the age of 30, who didn't know that there was a sort of mini Wall Street crash in 1988? Yeah. Seven? Where were we? I think 1988, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, although we shot it at Pinewood in England, it was American money. It was new world money. Um, so there was a huge impact on the budget. Fortunately, we weren't actually in production. We were still in a kind of soft prep. Um, I was down... Yeah, because we weren't at Pinewood yet. I was still working in a London hotel. Anyway, here's, here's where Tony Randall and his experience really uh, came into play and was, it was very useful. I woke up like <laughs> the rest of the Western world to that news and um, oh, maybe we were at Pinewood because I was picked up and driven <laughs> anyway. Um, but the driver and and other people have been saying, oh, you know, this is going to be bad. And I thought, oh, Christ, because, you know, this is my first movie. It's like, mm. what? I'm, it's movie's going to be ruined. Um, and I said to Tony, I guess this was after my third draft and while we were prepping the fourth draft, which was essentially the production draft. Mm -hmm. And I met with Tony and said, Christ, you know, what, what are we going to do? And he said, you're not going to do anything. Don't worry about it. Write the movie that we want to make. I'll save the money on set. And, um, hmm. and what he meant by that was, you know, if a scene had been budgeted for a three-day shoot, he'd shoot it in two. You know, right. he'd, 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 he'd lose figure away some of the problems. Yeah, so because, because unlike me, Tony had been 10 years in the business. Right. This was he his first directing gig. problems and stuff. He was very aware of production problems because he had been an executive in charge of production. He was the executive in charge of production on Hellraiser, yeah. which is how he met uh, Chris and Cl uh, Clive and Chris Fig. Again, a name people yeah. should know. Um, who well, was I think Jeff, you know, that would answer Jeff because he did a podcast of his own and they reviewed, you know, Hellbound. And so I think that was why he wanted to ask about it. He knew he had heard that there had been a big cut in the budget and he knows that you've talked about this before. So sure. I think that's covering that. Pretty I think good. I think there's yeah. also a good way of knowing exactly how that affected it is go see some of the older drafts of Hellbound where you had scenes like Frank and, and Larry would fight and they would be like uh, stitched together and there would be a room full of knives and all that stuff. That, oh, you've read that draft? Jim? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I've read, read all the drafts. I haven't. <laughs> I haven't read that one. That's great. This is the Barker cast. You know, yeah, we're obsessed about this yeah, stuff. Sure. But, sure. you know, of course, those things translate into money, special effects, more days of shooting. So those are some of the first things that go, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, big picture, yes. You're 100% right, Jose. In fact, though, um, the reason Larry and Frank don't fight or be stitched together is nothing to do with the budget problem. Okay. Uh, that was what is it? <laughs> Andy Robert, that was Andy not wanting to do the movie. Oh, um, of course, you know, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Right. So, hey, what about the Leviathan design? It was like a big, weird, you know, Cthulhu creature at one. In morning. the very first draft, and possibly oh. in the second draft, it was a big oozy Lovecraftian blob of goo in a in a in a slime pit which um, you still see the the penosaurus you know that's kind of yeah, a little remnant that is of that. a sense of what the whole thing would have looked like yes but again that what that was not budgetary that in the third draft maybe the after tony randall and i i have to say the surname to differentiate between him and hickox obviously because mm -hmm. we've got two tonys in the in the extended fam i say um, the tale of two tonys <laughs> the tale of two tonys but um no the the leviathan we all know and i hope love the the inverted uh inverted twin pyramids in the sky configuration the more crystalline that, pure entity right that that emerged 
either in the third or fourth draft and, and was a consequence of me and Tony talking because – and actually it was weird because it made me slightly nervous um, that – the fact I haven't well, the, the thing I haven't said yet makes me nervous. I'm getting my sentences in the wrong order. Tony was really, in terms of his own tastes, he was really a science fiction guy more than a horror guy. Mm. So, you know, I, I'd always had that little inkling of, well, you know, I, I wonder if he's going to deliver on the horror enough. <laughs> mm. um, Right, when I saw right. the dailies of Browning on the mattress with the razor, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I oh. got a. It was like, oh, okay, this guy's going for it. That's great. Um, but um, so I want to give him full credit for being an influence in that direction. So we came up with this more. We wanted the hell that we were going to to bear more visual relationship to the externals of hell we'd already seen, like the box. So instead of having flames and hellfire and caves of ice, not that I put any of that in the first draft either. Like Dante's but, Inferno. Um, the different yeah, right, right. Yeah. We wanted to avoid <clears throat> the Judeo-Christian hell. Um, well, and, and now, was I, that in I think conversations it's... with Clive about, like, in other words, well, that, that the was... Craftian demon and stuff? No, that was, that's, that's funny you should ask, Ed, because that was the Lovecraftian, because, I, I, as I'm, again, I'm sure everybody knows, the basic story of Hellbound was cooked up by Clive and I one night in Clive's apartment before I wrote anything. Um, so... Um, Leviathan, as, as as an Uzi Lovecraftian, had been Clive's visual for it in his head. Ah. We, we both knew there was going to be the monster maker. I, I, I'm trying to remember, again, 35 years ago, I'm trying mm. to remember how we talked about it. Because obviously when you're jamming and creating, you don't use posh words and good words. You know, so we were saying, that, yeah, and it's like a huge fucking vat of goo, and there's like a monster maker in there, and it's spewing out tentacles <laughs> and cenobites. And yeah. So, so I love that, it. <laughs> and I know that the visual in Clive's head had been this kind of postulant monster with tentacles. So I was, I mean, not nervous. We're all friends. It's all cool. But I thought, huh. I wonder if I'm going to get this geometrically precise yeah. uh, aseptic monster maker past him. Mm -hmm. um, but he and Chris were fine. They loved it. Um, as, because, you know, because I said it's a lament configuration in the sky. Well, and wow. it's, it's, so, so, uh, it's so effective because you can't, it's hard to wrap your head around it. It's like, what is that? What is the that? MC Escher world? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Right. For me, what makes it work is just the imposing nature of the scale of it, and then yeah. of course sure. the visual, the striking visuals of you know Simon Sacy's you know design mm -hmm. for the box. Rest and in peace. It, I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and I saw it on the big screen when it was. Yeah, brand new. me too. Yeah. So it's just so imposing that you actually buy it that that's the thing that keeps this dimension you know running that's the machine that keeps everything like going and it's dynamic and it's moving and then there's the black light that the executives didn't know what the fuck is black light you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well you know that yeah I, I works fine stuff. right yeah. Hey, <laughs> Milton had funny. black fire, right? Milton it's in Paradise so Lost. Different. You know, the right. yeah. Judeo Christian, you know, Christian hell, you know, yeah. hell, it's heaven and hell. That's why I loved it. You know, yeah. it was so different. I think we got two or three more questions, and I think did, then we. Did we did what? we dot every I and cross every T on that question, though? Because I, I got, so. got sidebarred yeah. into Leviathan. These people it's... don't expect us to dwell on this forever. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um,. Hmm. Another one here about uh, Hellbound. So there's this 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 guy who listens to the podcast. One of our listeners, his name is Kyle. He is so excited about the whole idea of Hellraiser. Oh, I and think Hellraiser. Pete's met him at conventions. He's the guy that dresses up at all the dog and I the, I, I, I have chatter about Sure, costume. sure. No, yeah. I, I I know Kyle um, cyberly. No, so he has a we, lot. Of we questions. haven't. I haven't <laughs> met him at a convention. Okay. But he's he sent questions and photos and things to the 
Roland Dark page. So yes, I, right. I, so I so I know Kyle, but we haven't technically met. Right, Hi, Kyle. Yeah. Well, I think you can run down these questions pretty quickly. You know, I, so. I think so. I'll ask some of the more interesting ones because it's kind of a run-on thing that he's got going on here. But he's really interested in Bloodline. He sure. wants to know. I think one of the main things is he wants to know if you ever saw Kevin Yeager's original cut of Bloodline, which would include sure. the masquerade ball party scene. So, I mean, I've seen that. You've seen that too. I right. mean, that's out there. So um, he says, if you remember seeing footage of Adam Scott in old age makeup. Now, as far as I know, that's I in don't the think... movie, I think, isn't it? Well, no. I was visiting the workshop with not? Kevin Yeager and I saw the, ske- the you know, old man, you know, prop dummy thing that was going right. to shatter. Right. But I think what happened was they were going to do it as a series of transitions with different faces. One more aged, one less sure. aged and then cut to him. Sure. As far as I know, I don't think that was ever shot. What they went with in the movie was Angelique just makes him close his eyes and then she has a big clawy hand and she she starts like slicing him up and then she takes his heart right, out. Right, but what, what Kyle wants yeah. to know is did Pete ever see a rough work cut with any of that old footage, oh, that old man age makeup stuff on that actor, Adam Scott, I guess. Right. Okay. So I'm... Ed, I'm so sorry. My, my AC kicked in <laughs> while, oh, while cool. you were asking the question. But you, you're you're saying, did I ever see the old age makeup on a work print? Yeah. Did you ever yeah. see a on rough? A, cut? Oh, Christ. I, here's the, here's the honest truth, I, and I know, I know this makes the fans very unhappy with me. Yeah. I haven't fine. seen your memory Bloodline. is fading. <laughs> I haven't seen Bloodline since it came out. Right. Um, I, yeah, so I and your memory know, of I, rough cuts and work prints and stuff. Yes, oh, of course. No, I, I saw all of them because, you know, right. they send me them. I saw Kevin's various, they usually call them, as you know, Ed, they call them assemblies. So I saw the various assemblies prior to, you know, his final battle with Bob Weinstein and uh, yeah. and and the appearance of Alan Smithy. Yeah. Um, so I saw various um, work prints all on VHS cassettes. I mean, that's, that's mm. how they sent them around in those days. Right, right. So I saw them, um, and, and I'm happy to go down Kyle's list and say, yes, saw that, no, didn't see that, yes, saw that's that. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. Just, just, just to give a, a bigger picture to this, I think um, – and again, the, the, what, why would people know the, the pragmatics of uh, specifically how movies are made? Mm-hmm. I think there's a sense among many people that there's some fantastic director's cut, a finished version of Kevin's take on the movie that was then butchered and replaced. And of course, that's, that's and Kevin would be the true. first to tell you. Yeah, he that did not finish it. Right, right. Because all the assemblies I saw until Kevin left the picture right. would have, you know, the things, I don't know the technical term, you're going through a scene and then you'll cut to, and there'll just be a handwritten title that says face second melts. unit stuff, right? Second right. unit stuff, like close well, up shots. It might shots, be a slug you know. that would say effect yeah. shot here. Correct. Right. That's right. exactly right, Ed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, to that extent, there is no way of making like some people have told us. Why don't you guys make a campaign like you did for Occupy Midian it's not to there. to make the the bloodline? It's like. Well, first That's of all, you point. need, That's a very you need to have a director that wants to come back and work on that. Right. Which and I don't think second, Kevin does. Yeah. It was yeah. a movie that was not completed and it, then had no, – so yeah. We could, never, we could yeah. never get Kevin to come back. That's I, d- I don't think I, Kevin would do it. Yeah. And secondly, yeah. It, um, we talked to him is, about this, that on one of our episodes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, no. I, and again, you know, I was very <laughs> lucky with the choice of directors. I, I got on – Kevin and I haven't stayed in touch as as it happens, though we, we never fell out uh, in any way. But I had a really good relationship with Tony Randall, Tony Hickox, and Kevin. Um, so I hope it's clear that I'm I'm not in any way bad. Ma- when I say there's no great directors cut out there, you're not disparaging. You know? I'm not oh, disparaging yeah, yeah. him. Right. He didn't right. get the chance to do all right. the shots that would have made that version that lives in people's heads. Yeah. Oh, you know, the version that's on, in the script. Yeah. Um, 
it just isn't there. They they never yeah. they didn't do those process shots. They didn't do yeah. the makeup shots. Right. They didn't do a lot of the visual effects shots. So yeah. But yeah, Kyle was, just wants to know. Give if me, you give me Kyle's him. list, and I'll say oh, yes or no. He just wanted to know <laughs> okay. if you'd ever seen like the scene of of uh, Lama Chant's wife, you know, on the dock, Genevieve on the dock things, with yeah. the boat. Um, I'm not that sure. That was shot. Yeah, I know that was, was shot. Oh, excellent. Well, okay, I didn't know that, so that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. See little tidbits like that, that, that Kyle. Is, you've is, seen Jose? Don't no, see? I don't remember that. No. I know. And then, I, then he, he see, wanted, that's been a while course. since I've seen the work print too. I mean, it's been several years since I've seen sure. the work print. Um, he had know about the the gamblers. Like, did you ever see the scene with all their ripped open mouths and all that? You know, the the mutilation that happened to the black guy and the and the you know the chubby. I was there. I saw their makeup. Yeah, set, you know, all those but, makeups happened. Yeah, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm. I can't remember if I saw them assembled into a sequence. But yeah, all that stuff was was. And then he claims that there was a scene where the chandelier falls on the table of all the gamblers. Oh yeah, no, stuff. we see that in the actual finished movie. We do I see the chandelier in the movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I think this is another thing we need to establish here is that people sometimes think that when a movie is being shot, that all the cast members are back behind the director's chair and the writer oh. is there <laughs> yeah. and the producers are there, and it's like it's not like that. So most times it's just you know. Union guys, uh, the, gaffers, the seven people that need you know, to be there for yeah, that right, show, right? Right, are there. Um, and, right, just, and, and everybody else work. is hanging out at the craft <laughs> yeah. services table trying to seduce yeah. each other. In fact, <laughs> I'm really impressed that all these none of these questions are about who was sleeping with who on these movies. <laughs> I'm very, yeah, very impressed. About that, you know? <laughs> Although, every time I see Adam Scott in a movie nowadays, I always oh, sure. point at him and I say, that guy started out in Bloodline. Hell was yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Same with Henry Cavill, Superman yeah. and The yeah. Witcher and all that stuff. I'm like, that guy's in Hellraiser 8, Hellworld. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's well, like, we, see, I didn't know that. that. I didn't yeah. know that because I've never seen those sequels. Right. Yeah. right. And, and that, but, that, that well, Pete, funny. you just answered a question. A whole bunch of people asked us, what do you think of the sequels past, you know, Bloodline? He see them. So, so yeah. that he answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, here's what, here's what I think about those sequels. Doug got a payday. So, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. All good. And, yeah. and actually, I will say, oh, I wanted to say, I'm glad if, if I can just be indulged for one second because I just want to that reminds me I wanted to say when we were talking about the Wishmaster sequels um, I want to remind everybody and I, I get bent out of shape as well as a fan and consumer I want everything to be great and I want the movies I like um, nobody ever means to make a bad movie nobody mm -hmm. wakes up and thinks let's let's fuck this franchise up sure. what about I know what Uwe Boll maybe what about him and his video game movies which he one? Doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't intend hey, to do okay. that. Uvo Bowl. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't make them on purpose bad. <laughs> I, I don't know. It kind of uh, looks like he does. Isn't he the guy who famously invites his critics to yes, fight to him? Box, to the yeah. boxing yes. ring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right. No, nobody, nobody <laughs> wants to make a bad movie. And even more specifically, when we had the 20th anniversary signing for Wishmaster, because yeah, that big box set came out, I guess first time on Blu-ray for, for the movies. And we had a, it was lovely. We had a session at Dark Delicacies, the the home of horror in Burbank. Oh, yeah, Del California. Howell's, he's such a great guy. I like Del. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it was great. Oh, yeah, Del and Sue have done, I mean, they, they host everything. The, 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 They've had book signings that, that Ryan went to all the way from Alaska and stuff. Yeah. They hosted oh, the first really? showing of the Rolling Darkness, right? Yeah, I, I had a broken yes, leg, and I correct. flew down. Yeah, to, yeah, I flew yeah, down yeah. to Dark Delicacies for a book signing for Midnight Meat Train. Oh. And Dell was an extra in Lord of Illusions. Me and Diane were Lord of Illusions. That's extras, so cool. Was yeah. Del. Isn't, correct. Isn't the audience, yeah. yeah, yeah. But so that so Dell did a signing for this this Vestron release of the Blu-ray for disc set of. Uh, Three disc set, two movies on the last one, I think, um, of Wishmaster. And I just want to say, Holly Fields and Chris Angel from the sequels, with the, it was me, Andrew, um, Bob, Harry Manfredini, brilliant composer, mm -hmm. Dave Trippett, the associate producer. But okay. also we had Chris Angel and Holly Fields from the sequels, who were just lovely. So 
I, I know we, uh, well, not me, you guys, bad-mouthed uh, three and four earlier. Um, <laughs> but I, I just want to say they're very nice. They were great people, mm -hmm. and nobody want to make a bad movie. And That's equally right. with the Hellraiser sequels, which for all I know, they might be masterpieces. I haven't seen them. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, you know, if, if people enjoy these movies, then the sure. power to them, of course. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to judge anybody for liking a movie. I think right. all cinema is, is wonderful. All cinema yeah. is magical. And it's a hell of it, a lot harder to get a movie made than people yeah. realize. Yeah, and it's a miracle that that uh, Bloodline got was able to get finished. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. At that point, I think they were trying just to finish it so they could make five and six. Um, but you know, even yeah, to I'm, this day, you know, who knows what was going on in the, in the Weinstein brothers' heads at, at right. that point? Right. Um, um, a lot of perv stuff, I'm sure. But I, I but, think we, we were good to the he, fans by covering. Harvey never made a move on two. me. I'm just saying that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I think we did cover this for the fans. We covered two. We covered three. We covered four. You know, yeah. It was great. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, someone just. master, you know. Did you so, did wait? Because I know Kyle can be a bit OCD-ish. Did you complete his list? No, yes. I did not. <laughs> do, you, do you want to hit other, other – let's tick off two more with a yes or a no. Uh, sure. OK. I'll tick off two more. Um, he mentioned something here about you, Ed, about a spell book that was made for the uh, oh, Hellbound. Oh, well, Pete wasn't there, so I guess I'll just answer this. I was on set with Gary Tonicliffe, and you know he knew that I was an effects guy too. And so they had a quick – request from kevin i guess oh, that they needed a big prop book a big prop book on set that they just had to throw together real quick so they were using like you know lemon juice they had some old book they got from a library or something or you know weathering the pages and you know trying to make it look and so it was like all hands on deck hey ed come and help us do this you know <laughs> that's mm. all right yeah and i think when uh jacques played by Adam Scott, uh, summons Angelique, he uses that book as a spell book to bring her back. Right. Or right. some other scene that maybe got yeah. cut or whatever. But, you know, it was like one of those last minute things that like art department needed help. And Gary said, hey, Ed, come and help us. You know, <laughs> and, I said, okay. and right. just one more for Kyle. He asks if you remember Bloodline having this is a really obscure. This is a deep cut. A, sure. a female security guard called Valerie Dyson. Mm. I think it's because well, the twins, well, you know, be get get or security guards yeah. get turned well, into yeah. the twins. I'm know? not sure what he means by doing. I mean, obviously, I remember Valerie Dyson because she's in the script, but right. I don't. Um, I don't think they shot that as a scene. They got the twins to come in and they shot the she, twins instead. She goes. She takes an elevator to hell, basically. In, right. In, right. In the sequence in the script, but I don't. I don't think that was ever ever filmed. And my question but, is: Is she a cousin or related to Valentine Dyson? Yes, that was my little in gag because, of course, w w the diminutive form of both names is Val, so right. they're both Val Dyson. Oh, okay. So that was just my wow. That was just my little wink to myself. <laughs> right. uh, Val Dyson. Well spotted, but I don't believe it was filmed, Kyle. I don't think so. So mm. the character is named Valerie Dyson, is what they're saying. Correct. Yes, for, for sure. I, I don't know if Kyle picked that up from a copy of the script or if um, I know okay. he's got a lot of memorabilia. If, if he has a, a well, call he sheet gets it off the Internet, he usually finds. It well, cool. yeah, it's, if, if he got it from a call sheet and there's a character name on the call sheet, then they certainly cast somebody as Valerie Dyson and brought her in. But I don't think so. I, I don't think that was filmed. I certainly have never seen that sequence. Okay, well, that's and, and the more. odds are, as I say, unfortunately, Kyle, like most of the, it, it's probably just not there. Um, and so some that, stuff that is, you know, an assembly could be made, but it would just be, it would be of interest to scholars. It would not be something. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know. What about Scholars, that right here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Pete, the character's name is from another source. What is the other source? You know? Oh, it's uh, it's the Return real of name Board of Justice. What? Yeah. Well, also Big Thunder. It's the um, oh. the, the the villain, sort of the villain in Big Thunder. Okay, is I have the blue is the blue Valentine. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. Because okay. um, it. In the Atkins verse. In the Blue Valentine is in the Return of Boy Justice. Right, right, but that okay. that's a that's a little wink at Big Thunder. 
Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, if you en- Ed, let me recommend a book to you. If you enjoyed The Return of Boy Justice, you might like Big Thunder because I it also features. Yeah, because Rob also recommended that on a on a review. Yeah, mm-hmm. he did. Oh, well, yeah. that that that's where the Blue Valentine first showed up as this sort of pulp hero. I look forward to it. That's there cool. you go. In fact, you can I, you wait for the audio book. When lockdown is over, I will finally finish the audio book of Big Thunder. And, uh, I look forward to that. We'll send you a code. Wonderful. <laughs> I have a, a last question. I think it's a perfect closer oh, question. Uh, we're still here. We're still hearing you. Um, are we back? Y- yes. I'm here. Okay, okay. excellent. All right. If everybody's okay, there's a wonderful question here by Jason Brooks, which works as a perfect closer for this episode. He sure. asks, bit of a dull question, but what has been your soundtrack to the stumbling slow motion apocalypse that has been 2020? <laughs> Any music suggestions? Is it Dig Out the Clash albums or is it straight to the Mahler? <laughs> wow. Um, Not dull at well. all. He's a Brit. <laughs> That that uh, fast. Uh, my tastes are wide. Um, I would certainly. I, I don't know. Marla might be a little much. Might be a little <laughs> funereal. Funereal, uh, in, yeah. In these times we live, it's probably better to put a Lady Gaga on instead. Well, you know, what have you been listening dance, to? He wants to know sake. what you've been listening to, Pete. Um, I listen to. Well. <laughs> This is a more complicated question than you would think. I when when you get to my age, son, mm-hmm. you realize that there's a great danger that you only listen to the music you liked in your youth. Oh sure. Um, we do so that. for about ten years, I was only listening to the music I grew up. You know the stuff you all everybody loves what they hear when they're fourteen to twenty. You know that's like the golden age of pop music for everybody. You know whatever decade it is and then very very consciously about eight or nine years ago i realized that the only presets on my car radio were an oldies station and Mm. npr and i thought well that's fucking ridiculous you know you you, (laughs) so but you hardcore guys won't like this (laughs) <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a top 40 guy I'm a pop music guy I, I'm a rock kid I grew up with rock music but it's look at that beauty <laughs> almost invisible yeah, yeah it's Lucifer yeah Lucifer yeah she's so, a queen <laughs> I am, <laughs> so so I said I've always been a pop guy what the hell is the top 40 station in LA so I, I deliberately found the top 40 oh. station and fell in love with pop music all over again. And I, I mean pop music. I mean like EDM, electronic dance music. I mean I mean the last golden age of pop music. This, this is going to lose me so many Hellraiser fans. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't think well so. Slit my fucking throat on camera. <laughs> Because, because I seriously, I was just in time for the last, the, no, the most recent golden age of pop music. California Girls by Katy Perry, Bruno Mars's first five singles, every, oh, sure. everything off Gaga's first album, anything Dr. Luke produced. I know he's a perv. I know he's Harvey Weinstein, but he made those <laughs> great records with Kesha and even Britney. And there was this there was this explosion of soundscape in popular music, pop music mm-hmm. from like 2008 through to about 2012. Um, and I was just I was just so happy to to like again what I'd always liked, which was the stuff that gets kids dancing. Sure. Because I'd loved hard rock when I was the first album I ever bought was Deep Purple in Rock uh-huh. I saw Zeppelin live in 72 but you can't liked, dance to that you, know? you can't dance to that yeah in the, I, in the I, because mercy, I also like Motown I like Motown beach. and Phil Spector so I honestly think and I, I can hear people groaning out there in oh, mix it up you know <laughs> yeah. but you gotta mix it up yeah and I, yeah. I like I like anything and everything it's um he, well, here's a closer for it. 
It's it's not. I'm sorry, I haven't provided a soundtrack list in answer to that great <laughs> question. Thank that. you for the you question. You kind of did, yeah. Um, but I'll say I want to quote the great Duke Ellington right. um, because it's lovely when people who you can admire don't buy in to bullshit. Mm-hmm. And Duke Ellington was being interviewed by some asshole who was. This is like in the late fifties. <laughs> who was trying to explain, because he thought Duke would be on his side, that jazz music was, of course, wonderful music and would be taken seriously by people who actually like music. Uh, but rock and roll is and got very dismissive <laughs> and tempted, wanted Duke Ellington to say something. And right. the Duke said, hey, man, there's only two types of music, good and bad. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It's exactly right because, you know, you might think you hate country and western, but you don't hate country and western. You hate bad country and western. Mm, sure. You might think you hate polka. You don't hate polka. You hate bad polka. You yeah. might think you like prog rock, but you don't like prog rock. You like good good prog, prog rock. Yeah. So there's, exactly. you know, That's you want like to you have an rock. open mind. You, know, yeah. you might yeah. like some of the clash or some of the sex pistols or something, but not everything, you know, you right. just don't, it's punk is the same way. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Two did, types you of music, into, good or bad. did you ever get into the laws or the exploding teardrop? Oh, the teardrop explodes. Well, the, those, the, well, the laws are younger than me. Teardrop explodes are exactly my contemporaries. There was, yeah. um, well, this is weird cause you're drawing it, but you very elegant, Jose. You are closing the circle on the conversation <laughs> it, yeah. by on going the, back the, to the second Mersey, the Mersey beat. beat. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, there was the 60s, obviously, the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, um, Billy J. Kramer, Silla Black, the Searchers. And then in the 80s, there was this second wave Mersey beat of Echo and the Bunnymen, Teardrop Explodes, uh, The Icicle Works, a whole bunch of... There was a real little scene going on in Liverpool, yeah. and they were all a year older than me, my age, or a year younger. Th- those are my contemporaries. Um, and and I was going to say something, but I've forgotten it. You're, <laughs> was, you're dating oh, yourself. <laughs> I, I will. I'll say this. This will make you laugh. And again, I've, I've told the story before, though perhaps not on camera. Um I was in a band. After, this is post Dog Company. I went back to Liverpool and formed a band called The Chase, and um, we weren't successful by any means. But we were a working band. We had a lot of gigs, and um, we we actually got played on the radio twice. Um, and this was eighty one, eighty two, eighty three. Um, and we used to rehearse at a place called the prison in Liverpool, which was literally a former prison that had been, the cells had been converted into little rehearsal studios. And we used to rehearse that, and a band used to rehearse in the one next to us. And I would occasionally bump into the lead singer of that band, who was a very sweet gay guy, and we'd have little conversations. And me and the lads in the chase would talk about it and say, isn't it a shame that they're so terrible. They're never going to have a hit. Yeah, it's bad because he's so nice, so nice. That was Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Oh. So, so three months after that, they had conquered the world. Right. And we we were still playing Relax. the Masonic pub on a Saturday night. <laughs> so, Relax. Um, Relax. Don't do it. Yeah, right. right. So listen to good music. And, to, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever genre of music, listen to the good stuff. Whatever genre of movie, watch the good stuff. Whatever genre yeah. of literature, read the good stuff. And yeah. by good, I mean the thing you like. And, Don't and, let anybody else tell you what's good or bad. If, it, if you like it, it's good. No such thing as a guilty pleasure. Pete, you've been a delight. I want to thank you so much. I'll for you guys. Thank you. Oh, my God. What? Three hours? <laughs> yeah. It flew by. Yeah. It flew I, by. Please I, edit it down to a tight 90 minutes. I was going to ask if I can do as the kid and hang out with you every Saturday for movies and cigarettes. That's, <laughs> well, that, that would be great. That would be that's, great. That's just, that would be a dream come true. Thank you so much for taking yeah. this time to be with no, us. Uh, th- how's, the, how's the fundraiser going? 
Uh, pretty good. Yeah. 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 All your stuff We're sold. Past the goal, yeah. past the first four everything, stretch goals. Everything you oh, yeah, yeah. sold, Pete. Oh, did everything. they show up, Ryan? Uh, not yet. No, but it's okay. It's, but you've you've got the tracking numbers. So. Yeah, yeah. Stuff is a little oh. slow getting to it. Well, getting to Alaska, and and here it's only one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And th- yeah. things get to you on a barge, right, Ryan? Well, if it's sent media mail, they do send stuff on a barge. And I want to do a plug right here before we end, which is go to Glenn Hirschberg's uh, site. The shop is there and has all these chapbooks from. The Rolling Darkness review. Oh, does he does he still have them up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He huh. still has them up. I don't get and... any money from those sales. I should. Put <laughs> <up> a... <laughs> <Kidding>. <laughs> so I'm seeing yeah. a lot of them, and this very attractive package here, the Rolling Darkness review five year anniversary pack. That stuff looks good. Uh, it's got uh, oh, well, four right. chet. Yeah, at least it's still here. It says only while supplies last. And it's yeah, four I'm, chat books. Mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure when Glenn last updated his website. Uh, so right. So I don't, but here's the thing. Anybody who's kind enough to be interested in the stories, I, I'd love you to track down the chat books because they're, they're attractive little chat books that Paul Miller from Earthing Publications did for right. us. Um, but if you can't find the chat books, you can hear these stories for free on the Rolling Darkness Review YouTube channel. So... Please, yes. Um, plug away. Please and go also, check them out. Those people who are end of plug. Like Sorry, me, guys. It's What's a that it's a wonderful resource for those people like me who are sightless to listen to the podcasts and listen to the Rolling Darkness Review YouTube channel. I watch. You know, mm-hmm. I listen to the podcast through the YouTube, and I listen to the mm-hmm. Rolling Darkness Review stories through the YouTube, and it's wonderful for people like me who are sightless. So just well, that note. that's fantastic, Ed. I'm so glad. That's that's great. And all the audio books that you're doing, <laughs> I'm just li- really looking forward to. Yeah. Wonderful. So who's going to do the honors in closing the podcast? Pete, do you know the line? <laughs> Um, yes thank you for listening to the Clive Barker podcast Uh, a non-profit made by fans for fans blah 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 (laughs) here's the line and this podcast having no beginning shall have no end oh my god that's awesome thank you thank you you. you. (laughs) all right cheers guys yeah cheers great to see you I'll see you You online yeah absolutely Uh, how how do we get out of this uh, you just click the red telephone. You just click yeah. the red. Okay. Great, great to see and hear everybody. Thank you. Thank Cheers, you. Nina. Cheers, Ed. Thank see you guys. You. Thank Take you. Take care. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com. We've got an archive of past episodes, news, features, and reviews, along with all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on every other place you can find podcasts. Share your thoughts with us and share our podcast with your friends. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that's not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.